Good morning, good morning. Could we start taking our seats, please? Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, can we take our seats please? Good morning, please take your seats. We're gonna call a meeting to order and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance please. Good morning, everyone, and happy New Year's to you. At this time, we do not have a quorum, but we're going to get started. We're going to ask to have our roll call, please. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Senator Polsky, I know she's in the building, but Senator Polsky, Senator Ogden, Senator Book, Representative Hunchofsky, yeah. Representative Daly, Representative Dunkley, Representative Campbell. Here. Thank you. Representative Lamarca. Representative Cassell. Here. Thank you. Representative Gottlieb. Representative Bartleman. Representative Robinson. Representative Woodson. Here. Vice Chair Pizzo. Chair Williams. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that we have one of our constitutional officers here today. We're going to start with the welcome from MPO. We have someone here. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the MPO and all the fine things that the federal government can bring to all of us. Um, I'm actually gonna do a really quick uh, introduction of some things that are going on uh, that you'll need to know when you're up in Tallahassee and you're gonna be seeing things coming through the budget uh, as you approve that up there. Uh, one of the things to look at for us is actually our, um, <laughs> we actually monitor ourselves by the federal government on our performance. Performance for us is safety as well as pavement performance. So in trends for safety, you can see that line, yeah, we're doing a little bit better than we should, which is a good thing as far as deaths and uh, pedestrian fatalities. Um, we're actually looking at performance measures uh, that were areas we're hitting on. So you can see we're performing well, except for one particular area on the chart. Uh, systems performance is doing well. And this is where I said we were gonna see this in your budget. Uh, basically with the IIJA passed in Washington, we've seen about a 35% increase in tra federal transportation dollars. You'll be approving that in your state budget uh, while you're up in Tallahassee. About that 33% comes back home increase. So that's what we're gonna be providing to our local governments here. Past that point, uh, as I was talking to you about uh, grant opportunities in the IIJA, 
together with Broward County government, we've actually applied and for 32 or 31 municipalities, we've applied for four grants. If all of those hit, you know, we're gonna be very, very busy doing administration side of things. And again, that will hit into your budget in Tallahassee as well. So that will be probably a budget amendment when you get together. Um, one of the most important and significant items that are in there is actually the Safe Streets for All grant, which will allow all the 31 local governments to apply for over $50 billion worth of additional funding uh, to bring down here to Broward. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, side note on that, if you look at something else that happened up in Washington this year, they passed their federal budget. And because they did, there were earmarks again, or federally directed spending is what it's called. And there's the list of projects coming to Broward and our municipal governments. So that way you're aware that that will also, at least the ones in blue, will be coming through the DOT budget that you'll be uh, approving. The HUD projects come directly to the local governments. And with that said, I also wanna let you know what we're doing with the federal dollars. And of the $5.7 billion this agency receives, it's 430 projects here in Broward. It fits into our goals that you have on the walls there. You can see yourself, uh, what we're doing with our transportation improvement plan, which is actually our capital program. And then ultimately, I wanna invite you all to our awards banquet on February 3rd um, here at the Diplomat Hotel. We're having dignitaries from Washington DC coming down from USDOT. So if you have a chance to attend, it would probably be a very good idea for you to meet our colleagues up in Washington, recognizing where a lot of the current money is coming from. And then at the same time, those two days, we're also hosting an educational program at the Diplomat called the Safe Street Summit. And that's usually about 500 and so people. And we also have the Dutch embassy um, and the Dutch delegation coming over here to talk to our folks about what they do to increase pedestrian and bicycle safety in their communities. And with that, good luck on your meeting. Thank you very much, sir, for allowing us to be here. Good morning again. If everyone have received a copy of our agenda today, we know we have a very, very packed schedule. Um, we have a visitor here from the governor's office. If she would like to come and say a word or two. Good morning, Chair and Representative Senators. Um, my name is Sylvia Castellanos. I'm the Regional Representative for Governor DeSantis um, down in South Florida. I cover Monroe, Miami-Dade, and Broward County. So just want to come here and listen to you know, the issues going on in Broward, and hopefully we can take some positive feedback back to the governor's office and work together to solve some issues. Thank you. I know this is very unusual for us to have someone here. Those of you that are here that's asking for money, y'all see that lady right there. We're going to start off with our Constitution officer, Marty Kerr. He's here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate so much y'all having me today. And uh, before I just quickly talk about the things that we're supporting this year, I wanted to thank you, everybody up here, for your amazing service. As you know, one time, many, many years ago, I served in the Florida House of Representatives, and I know how difficult it is when you're away from your families, you're gone for a long time, you're in that godforsaken cold weather, and uh, it is hard, uh, but I really appreciate the sacrifice that you all make. And I also want to thank so much the staff of the delegation. I have to tell you, Andrea is just wonderful. She is incredible. And you have an amazing legal counsel in Lewis Ranch. And I'm not just saying that because I've been driving him crazy. He's my council member in Plantation. Uh, but you all do just a fantastic job. And uh, with that said, uh, the first thing that I just wanted to quickly talk about was uh, before I talked about legislation that we're supporting is legislation that you all passed last year that I wanted to thank you for because this legislation is gonna make a big difference for the people of Broward County. And the first piece of legislation that I wanted to reference were, was actually amended into the tax package. And that was 7071. But the two that were amended, first was House Bill 13 by Representative Gottlieb and Senate Bill 154 by Senator Rodriguez. And what that did was something very important. It basically increased the amount that a widow who is struggling to make ends meet can save in their property taxes. In 1969, the widow's exemption was enacted by the people of Florida. And in that time, it basically said that $500 of value was going to be taken off the tax roll they wouldn't pay taxes on. At the beginning, it saved people about nine bucks a year. Well, unfortunately, decades went by, it was never increased. And even last year, it saved people nine bucks a year. 
But fortunately, Representative Gottlieb was able to amend that in the tax package. It was supported by everybody up here. And this year, for the first time, those widows who struggle to make ends meet are going to be able to save about 100 bucks a year now, which is real savings that can help them in difficult times. The other bill I wanted to quickly mention was a very heavy lift that Representative Woodson was instrumental in passing, and along with Senator Polsky, who was the Senate sponsor. And that also was amended into the tax package, and it's called an abatement bill. And it was designed to help people during one of the most difficult times of their life. And here's basically what it said. If a property was destroyed by calamity and was your home, for the time of the year that the home was destroyed and couldn't be used, you would basically be a, exempt from paying taxes on the property. It passed, it's a great bill, and this year it's going to affect and help the people that are really uh, going through very, very difficult times. So thank you so much, Representative Woodson and Senator Polsky. I think I saw her just before. I think those are excellent, excellent pieces of legislation. Now, this year, there are a few pieces of legislation that we're really supporting that I think will be very, very important. And the first one that I wanted to talk about and in the packet that I gave to you, it shows that it's been filed by Representative Woodson. It's House Bill 101. I had not included Senator Polsky's uh, bill in there because it just came out today. And it's Senate Bill 184. And it really fixes a very important inequity that occurred. You may remember a few years ago, there were two American hero FBI agents that had to serve a warrant on a person who was engaging in child pornography. They walked to his sunrise door to serve the warrant, and he opened fire. And when he opened fire, they were both killed. And it was a travesty. And during that time, I wanted to give them a full property tax exemption because under Florida state law, if you are a totally permanently disabled first responder or if you lose your life while serving us under state law, if you're a state first responder, your spouses are fully exempt from paying property taxes. So I called the Department of Revenue and I basically said, listen, I understand that these were not state first responders, but they were homesteaded Broward County property owners at the time they lost their life. Their spouses deserve this exemption. And they basically said to me, sorry, Marty, Florida law does not allow that. They have to be state first responders. And it's one where I wouldn't take no for an answer. We kept going back and forth. And they finally said, listen, if you can find one interlocal agreement they had with a local state agency, in this case only, we'll let you give it to their families. Fortunately, the Broward County School Board, which has its own police force, had an interlocal agreement with the FBI in the service of those warrants. And so their families now benefit from this exemption. But it shows that everybody else that is a federal a law enforcement officer that lives in Florida, if they lose their lives right now in the line of duty, their spouses don't get that. And if they become totally permanently disabled, they would not get that. So Representative Woodson has filed House Bill 101. I would love everybody up here to co-sponsor it. Uh, and Senator Polsky has filed Senate Bill 184. I'd also love you all to co-sponsor that as well. And that fixes this inequity by doing two things. It basically says that if you are a federal law enforcement officer and you lose your life while serving us and you were a homestead at Broward County property owner at that time, you are going to be your family, your, your spouse, your surviving spouse will be fully exempt from paying property taxes. And it also says that if you are a totally permanently disabled first responder and you worked for the federal government and lived in Broward County or the state of Florida at the time of your injury, you'll be fully exempt from paying taxes. It's a great bill, a great law that fixes an important inequity. And so I thank you so much, Representative Woodson and Senator Polsky for filing this very good piece of legislation. The next one that I wanted to quickly talk about and I know that Representative Daley has been working on this, and there's actually been a senator that has filed this legislation. It's an important exemption that's called the long-term senior exemption. So right now, if you're a long-term senior and you're a low-income senior, basically last year you had to have made under 35,000 bucks. And if you're over 65 years of age, and if you've been in your home for 25 years or more, and the value of your home is under $250,000, you are exempt from paying the county portion of the tax bill and whatever city you live in if they've adopted it as well. Now, as you know, Broward County property values have skyrocketed. There are very few properties right now that are under 250,000. So Senator uh, Vila, and um, I'm not yet sure if there is a House companion, uh, has filed a proposed constitutional amendment, this state's a constitutional amendment, to increase that to about 300,000. It'll just give more seniors struggling to make ends meet the opportunity to have the benefit of this very, very important exemption. The other piece of legislation I wanted to quickly talk about is I think a very important piece of legislation that my friend, uh, uh, the chair of the delegation, Patricia Williams, has filed. And this, I think, will hope deter people from committing a crime against a 501c3 or a church or a nonprofit in the future. You know, every single day, our office works with thousands of nonprofits throughout Broward County, whether they're churches, whether they're charities, organizations that do a great job making a big difference for a whole lot of people. And what really makes me angry 
is when there is somebody that frauds one of those 501c3s, frauds one of these churches, steals their money, and makes it to where they can't operate anymore, and they have to close their doors and shut their lights down, and the people suffer. So Patricia Williams, uh, we've been working with, with Representative Williams, has filed a proposed law that's going to hopefully deter people from doing this in the future. Because what it does, it brings enhanced criminal penalties to people who fraud a 501c3, who fraud a church, who fraud a nonprofit. And what it does is it basically says if you steal $50,000 or more, it's a first degree felony. If you steal $10,000 but not more than $50,000, it's a second degree felony. And if you have anything from $300 to $10,000 stolen, it's a third degree fel felony. I think it's a great thing that will hopefully deter bad people from ripping off our churches and 501c3s and nonprofits in the future. Uh, it doesn't yet have a bill number, uh, but I believe it will soon. And when it does, I would love everybody to co-sponsor that as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just quickly talk about uh, before I answer to any questions that y'all had uh, was another issue that is very, very important to our office. And this doesn't really have anything to do with you all being up in the legislature, but it has something to do with us working together to get the word out so we can help protect people from title fraud. Now, unfortunately, as you know, and I've said it many times, South Florida is the title fraud capital of the world. You have criminals, and that's what they are. They walk into the recording divisions for every single county in the state of Florida, and they file deeds on people's property, changing title, and they take those properties, and they uh, extort people for money, mortgage rent, or sell the property. And it's very easy for them to do because the recording divisions have a ministerial duty. They have to accept whatever documents filed with them. So these criminals walk in, file these fake deeds, and they do something nefarious with it. So the first thing that we did about a year and a half ago is we came up with a great program called Owner Alert. It's really a notification program that notifies people if a deed or a title change has been filed on their property legitimate or not. And the way that people sign up is they just go to our website at bcpa.net, they type in their name, they type in their email address, they type in their parcel ID number, which they easily grab from our website. And then if any document legitimate or not is filed changing ownership on their property, they're notified instantaneously. We've had about 180,000 Broward County property owners sign up so far, and we've alerted about 30,000 people of deed changes. And a few of those have actually been fraudulent deeds where we've stopped a, a fraud from happening on the public as a result. Now, I said 180,000, but there are 700,000 property owners in Broward County. And this is where I really hope that we all can work together, because I know that everybody up here has a connection with the people in their districts. And I was just wondering, attached to the, what I sent out, was really just our owner alert flyer. And if anybody here would like us to bring those flyers to their office, if you could just give them to your constituents as they come in, I think it can go a very, very long way. We also have an uh, e-newsletter version of it. And if you'd like to send that out, that can go a long way as well, because I've learned that by working together, we can capture the most people in Broward County and help them be protected. And the other thing I just wanted to quickly bring up is what we've been doing to help prosecute these people. Uh, you know, as I said before, it is a travesty when you see what these criminals do. And it really bothers me because I see the people that they're picking on. They pick on our most vulnerable. They pick on our seniors. They pick on low-income folks. They pick on people who own property here but may not live here. They are so smart that they pick on whoever they think they can pick on that they can best get away with it. And the biggest common denominator about all these criminals is that they, if they just did something legitimate, they'd be multimillionaires. Instead, they make their money by defrauding the public. And so it's my goal to put them all in jail. And so we actually, in our office, have developed a great department called our Crimes Against Property Department. And the county commission authorized the addition of two new uh, people in our, that department that have significant law enforcement experience. And they work with law enforcement to build criminal cases against people who are doing this. We entered into interlocal agreements with the Broward State Attorney's Office and also the Broward Sheriff's Office. And my friend, Sheriff Tony, even uh, assigned a detective solely to work with our office that's housed in our office that's part of that unit. And ever since they started just a few months ago, they've actually been able to find 60 fraudulent deeds. We've had six arrests, and a few of those have been convicted. And let me give you an example of one of those that really shows how smart these people are. You had two wives. One wife worked for the, one of our hospital districts. The other wife worked in the real estate industry. The wife in the hospital district would find out when people would pass on. She would then take that information, including their social security number, and give it to her wife in the real estate industry, who would then find out if they had property in Broward County, and if they had heirs here, if they had property and no heirs, they'd file fake deeds in the properties, they'd mortgage the property, sell the properties, rent the properties. They would do all kinds of different things to these properties. They profit in the amount of millions of dollars. Uh, fortunately, they were found guilty recently. And what I'm very happy about, even though they're a married couple, they'll be spending their time in different prisons, which I think is a good thing. I can go on and on forever about these stories, but I wanted to just bring that up just because I want the legislator to know that we are working very hard for the people of Broward County to try to hold these people accountable. 
And I also like to talk about it because I know there may be people watching online. There's people in the audience. I think the news media might report on it because I want to shout from the rooftops what we're doing because I want all of these people who are thinking about doing this to know that if they do this in Broward County, they're not welcome here and we're going to work very hard to put them in jail for a long time. I appreciate y'all so very, very much. I was so excited to come. Uh, with that said, does anybody have any questions I can answer? Y'all are awesome. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. Because of our tight, spit, uh, tight schedule that we have today, I'm asking those of you that may have a question or want to have a conversation with him, please meet him on the side. And I'm also asking all staff members that's in the audience, please come have a seat on the counter on the desk with us to the right as we proceed. And we also have additional seats in the overflow room. Staff members, please come have a seat up on the dais with us. To my right, please. And I just want to- And thank Rep. Woodson have a question before you actually walk. Oh, oh sure, of course. Thank you, thank you, Representative Wiggs. Come here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Keir. You. Thank you. Uh, I have to thank you for the work that you are doing in Broward County. As a former legislator, you understand the process and you have helped so many of us to be the best legislators that we can be in the state legislature. So for that, we are grateful and we are thankful to have you in Broward County as the best property appraisers in, in the state. Thank oh. you so much. Thank you, Representative Woodson. And thank you for your amazing service to the people of Broward County. And I wanna thank everybody up here again. You know, as I said before, I know it's not easy to serve in the Florida legislature, especially with Tallahassee being so very, very far. But I honestly believe with all my heart we have by far the best delegation in the state of Florida. So thank you all so much for your service. You all are wonderful. Have an incredibly great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. As our um, Broward County Public Defender approached um, the, the, approach the, what do we call it? Podium. <laughs> I am going to ask that um, Andrea call the roll and see if we have a quorum. It's very important that we get certain things done. And if we have a quorum in place right now, I would like to, for us to start that process, if possible. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair. Roll call for quorum. Senator Polsky. Senator Osgood. Senator Book. Representative Hunschowski. Representative Daly. Here. Thank you. Representative Dunkley. Representative Campbell. Representative Lamarca, Representative Cassell, Representative Gottlieb, Representative Bartleman, Representative Robinson, Representative Woodson, Vice Chair Pizzo, Chair Williams. Here. We have quorum. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask our attorney to um, do the first reading for Bill 1 and 2, possibly 3. Okay. Okay, he's going to do all three. Um, first call, um, first reading for Bill 1, 2, and 3, and also Annex. Please. First Thank reading. You. Number one, a bill to be entitled an act relating to Broward County, providing a short title, creating an independent special district to provide and fund senior services throughout Broward County, providing for a governing body to be known as the Senior Services Council of Broward County, providing for such council's membership powers and duties and budget procedures, authorizing the levy of ad valorem taxes not to exceed one half mil, providing for additional district powers, duties, responsibilities, and obligations, providing for dissolution of the district, providing for a referendum and ballot question, providing effective dates. Number two, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the Sunshine Water Control District, Broward County, codifying, reenacting, amending, and repealing the district charter, providing legislative intent, providing for continuation of authority for revenue collection and powers to meet outstanding obligations, providing a definition, repealing chapters 63-609 and 2021-255, Laws of Florida and Chancery Decree number 62-4596-F relating to the district, providing an exception to general law, providing an effective date. Number three, a bill to be entitled, an act relating to the town of Southwest Ranches, Broward County, providing an exception to general law, 
prohibiting the sale and use of fireworks located within the town of Southwest Ranches, providing an exception and applicability, providing an effective date. Those are the three bills. I'm asking that those be rolled over for the second reading. And and station also. Thank you. We have two annexations. Number one, ordinance number 2022-005, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Dania Beach, Florida, authorizing by voluntary petition the annexation of land, 22,425 square feet located between Anglers Avenue, also known as Ravenswood, Ravenswood Road and Southwest 22nd Avenue, Southwest 42nd Street and Southwest 39th Street which real property is owned by SMS of South Florida Incorporated, a Florida corporation, into the corporate limits of the city of Dania Beach, Florida, pursuant to section 171.044 Florida statutes and providing a legal description of the property subject to the voluntary annexation, providing for publication of notice, providing for filings with the appropriate governmental agencies, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, further providing for an effective date. Local bill number two, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the city of Parkland, Broward County, annexing into the corporate limits of the city of Parkland an approximately 3.83 acre parcel of contiguous land located in unincorporated Broward County, providing an effective date. Those are the local bills. Those are the annexations. Thank you very much. Um, Public Defender Gordon, are you ready, sir? I do apologize. Sharon, just a point of order. Those also will be rolled over the annexation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and all the members of the delegation and your legislative assistants. I appreciate you getting me the opportunity to speak to you today uh, to tell you about some concerns, the issues that are important to my office. As you know, my name is Gordon Weeks. I'm the public defender. I am responsible for representing those folks that find themselves in trouble with the criminal justice system and who cannot afford an attorney. That is a very awesome responsibility. It is the balance of the criminal justice system. It brings the fairness and the equity that we all desire uh, into our court system. One of the most important issues that I am facing and it is echoing not only in my office, but offices all throughout the state of Florida, including the state attorney's office, is the inability to retain skilled attorneys to do this work. You know, last legislative session, you know, I appreciate and I know that there was a lot of support and a lot of guidance from this de delegative uh, uh, body to help us with pay increases um, for our staff particularly our attorneys. That was very much appreciated. Um, it was well-deserved. However, you know, with the constant cry, rise in inflation, with what's going on uh, in our communities, uh, with rent and uh, home purchases, you know, it's, it's very apropos that I'm following the property appraiser that talked about the increases uh, throughout Broward County. It is very difficult for us to retain uh, staff that is willing and committed to do this work um, with the pay that we're doing. It's not only difficult to retain skilled and competent attorneys, it's difficult to retain the support that's needed in order to do the work. The legal assistants, the secretaries, the interns, strike that, the investigators, that all are required to do this work and do it at a high level. And I'm very proud of the work that we do in this office. I'm proud of the issues that we have championed in this community, and we will continue to do that. But in order for us to do that at a very high level, in order for us to do that effectively, we have to be able to keep attorneys for longer than three years. Um, the reality is they graduate from law school. Um, they really don't know how to uh, try cases and we have to train them. Um, that has been our mission, our constant mission of training. But we're on a hamster wheel because once they get to a level of proficiency, a level of competency, they become very, very valuable on the public market. Their skills become very valuable. And there are law firms all across the nation, law firms all across Florida that are dipping right into my office, right into the state attorney's office and taking some of the most valuable and most experienced attorneys into the private sector. 
we cannot compete. We need to have the resources to be able to compete. I'm asking all of you to assist us in that endeavor to make sure that our attorneys are the most skilled, the most competent, but more importantly, that our legal staff is also equally supported so we can do this very, very necessary and very important work. The second issue that's important to us um, that has been an issue that has been plaguing Broward County is our Juvenile Justice Detention Center. For many years, that detention center has been recognized as being ready for replacement. Um, that detention center is constantly uh, having re overhauls. Um, it is not the facility that we would desire for our children to be placed in if they're being held by the Department of Juvenile Justice, but we can do better. Um, there seems to be some support and some interest in moving that item forward uh, with the Department of Juvenile Justice. We are one of three centers in the state of Florida that's been identified for replacement. That's Broward County, Hillsborough County, and West Palm Beach. But we need to have your support to make sure that we shepherd that through the Department of Juvenile Justice, that it gets in the final budget, and that we have the appropriate funds so we can start building and planning for a better detention center. We are not trying to build cages for children. We do not want to put them into jails. But what we want to do is with the opportunity of designing and building new detention centers, bring some of the best practices to Broward County for how children should be treated in this system. And we can do that with your help, with your support, but more importantly, your navigation of Tallahassee. I appreciate every one of you for sacrificing your, your time to go up there and deal with those issues that are in Tallahassee. I know they're very difficult, um, but I'm asking you to help us in the criminal justice system. More importantly, to help us retain the best gifted attorneys in the state of Florida, but also to help our children be able to lay their head in a place that is appropriate for their care, that is going to be of rehabilitation as opposed to incarceration. And I'm, I think we can do that as a community, but we can't do that alone. So with that, I am not going to belabor this. You know, I'm an attorney and I can talk forever. Um, but I, I was told I only to get 10 minutes, so I will end my comments there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. If any of our members have any questions, please let me. Rep. Gottlieb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, not a question, really more of us, uh, just a, a comment. I want to let uh, Public Defender Weeks know that I've already met with DJJ. Um, I had a second meeting, but I can't remember with who regarding the the LBR. Oh, some of the criminal justice staff regarding the LBR for the three new facilities. As you know, it's just for investigative purposes, but hopefully they'll find a suitable location. Um, I also tasked them with um, DJJ with looking under, I think it was uh, House Bill 1029 to see if there are, and I'd like to talk to you offline about it, if there have been requests in Broward County to extend beyond the 21 days, because I think that's really important given the law that passed in the last session. And I appreciate your advocacy. Thank you, Rep. Gottlieb. I really appreciate the work that you've done shepherding this through and all of you, all of the other members, I appreciate all of the things you've done to move this item forward. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Okay. Well, we're gonna start at this point, but before we actually start, I wanna actually say the staff members that we have here that have joined us to my right, we have a couple on the left. I wanna say thank you for all you do. These are the people that make us look good. With my newest member of the bunch, um, Mr. O'Connor, Brian O'Connor, he will be happy, he has the opportunity today. He's gonna to be our reader for the different groups and organizations that has joined us. So I'm just giving him the opportunity to have the experience that um, I would think that someone should have given to me when I was a young child, a young person growing up. So at this point, I'm gonna have um, Mrs. Hill join us. Thank you. As we begin our public hearing portion, just wanna make, make um, the audience aware there's a two minute time limit for speakers. We do give an extra grace to our constitutional officers. That's why you see that they have a bit more time. But um, if you have the agenda in front of you and you see it on the screens, please be prepared to come right up after the speaker before you speaks. And we will get back to second reading later today. 
there is extra seating in the overflow room. If there is anyone that still needs a seat, unless you just want to keep your legs stretched, we're going to start with Cindy Ehrenberg Seltzer, CSC, or her designee. Good morning, everyone. Of course, I'm not Cindy. <laughs> um, she's not here today because she's ill, but she sends her, her regards. I am Dr. Sharetta Ramiki, and I serve as the Chief Equity and Community Engagement Officer for the Children's Services Council of Broward. Um, most of you may be familiar with Sandra Bernard Bestine. She was a previous employee with CSC for 25 years and she retired. And that allotted um, CSC the opportunity to kind of expand the position to align more with what we actually do in the community around equity and community engagement. So thus, here I am. Um, I would also like to inform you that Megan Tereski, who's here in the audience, is no longer with CSC, but don't fret. She's still helping the kids in Broward County. She's over with the school district now, so we wish Megan well. Um, so moving forward, our government affairs communications and involvement will mostly be with me and the person that I find to fill the position that make it, Megan left vacant. Um, one of our top legislative priorities as reps LaMarca and Bartman are aware is kid care. Um, we want to ensure the, um, um, a, the fiscal cliff that address, is addressed so affordable insurance is available for children. But CSC continues to do everything about children from pregnant individuals experiencing maternal depression to youth aging out of foster care, as well as youth with special needs. CSC is supporting, connecting, and funding needed resources and services so all children have an equitable chance to thrive in a diverse and interconnected community. Thank you. Okay, Sylvia Quintano. And if you could just kind of line up um, as well after her. We uh -huh. Dr. Jermaine Barr, Jermaine Smith Barr from the Urban League. And I believe there's probably an extra couple of minutes for Dr. Dr. Barr. Thank you. Good afternoon. Should I start? Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. Hi, Christine. Um, I want to thank you all very much for last year's support of the behavioral health system. As you know, Broward Behavioral Health, I'm the CEO of Broward Behavioral Health Coalition, um, and we are in charge of providing behavioral health services to anyone that is. Uh, indigent or underinsured in Broward County. We, um, we were able to benefit from your great allocation last year um, of 26 million through the throughout the state of Florida. Broward County received about $12 million of that allocation, which really helped us with creating multidisciplinary teams to support families and children, uh, and also our care coordination for both adult and children um, that have been high recidivists in our emergency rooms, in, in the, in the uh, crisis units, receiving facilities and so forth. Because of your funding, we've been able to reduce the high recidivist in the adult system to less than 1% for high utilizers. And for children and families that continue to recycle through our crisis units, which as you know, continues to provide trauma for them as they continue to be big corrected, uh, we've been able to reduce it to a, a less than 10%. And we want to continue to do so. And thanks to your recurrent funds last year, we are going to be able to hopefully continue with that effort, uh, in addition to a lot of other programs that you provided. So we, we need that continued support. I also um, I want to tell you that I have packets for you, which I will hand out, that you will have. We have an enhancement plan that was created by all the community stakeholders that talks about our priorities for next year. Um, one of them has to do with the amount of mentally ill clients that we have in the jails. I'm sure that. Uh, Sheriff Tony uh, is going to uh, talk about that when he when he does that, and I know he's done that in the press already. Um, and we're trying really hard to get those people out of the jails and working it out with the judges. But one of the things that we need in Broward is more residential beds for people that need to come out of the jails, and also affordable housing because part of what happens is that we have a gridlock. People come out into our residential programs; they need to go into affordable housing, and they don't have enough enough. Um, we don't have enough housing to place those people there. So we're asking for, and you'll see it in our plan, additional residential beds, especially a Brower alternative forensic program for people that are more severe. And um, some, uh, we're gonna need some capital outlay, one-time only money to be able to refurbish a facility that we found on the, on the 
uh, forming campus. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jermaine smith I serve as the president and CEO of the Urban League of Broward County. Just want to say good morning to everyone. And for the first two minutes that I have, and then the extended time that the chair has provided for me to address an education issue, just really want to thank you for your continued support, not only of the Urban League of Broward County, but the Florida Urban Leagues across the state of Florida. Uh, the Urban League here in Broward has been in this community since 1975. And we continue to provide a myriad of services in the areas of education, entrepreneurship, jobs, justice, and health. Um, we're also expanding the work that we do, particularly, particularly on a macro policy level, advocacy and outreach by adding a new division, which we have entitled Policy Advocacy and Racial Equity, which will be led by Ms. Kirsty Miles Esquire, and she's here today and definitely can be a contact for your respective offices. I also wanna thank you for the time that many of you spent with us, um, when I say us, Hispanic Unity of Florida and the Urban League of Broward County, um, when we presented to you the state of Black Broward and the state of Hispanic and immigrant Broward. Um, that information or that time that we shared together really helped us to propel other areas. And these three legislative priorities are important, not only to the Urban League of Broward County, but to the Florida Urban Leagues across the state, which there are nine. The first and foremost is our small business lending. Um, because of your support over the years, the Urban League of Broward County is the only community development financial institution headquartered in Broward County. We've lent over $2.7 million to minority businesses. And I wanna thank um, each of you for your support. That appropriation request will continue and that actually runs through the entire state of Florida. And in your packet, there is a one pager that gives you the impact statement of that. The second is um, affordable housing and infrastructure. As we know, the Senate president has made that one of her priorities. I don't need to talk about the challenges of housing affordability because you all know them. I just want you to know that the Urban League of Broward County is committing every asset that it has, including over 15 acres of property to deliver to Broward County the largest number of, of affordable housing topologies ever in the history of Broward County. And we would love for the Broward delegation to truly lock arms across the state of Florida, working with the Senate to come up with pilot and financial innovations that allow for true affordable housing that gets to the heart of the issue, which is individuals who are 30, 50, 60% of AMI. That we can talk about um, further. For the extended time that I've been granted, I wanted to and have been asked to just speak very briefly to the issue of education. During the time that you met with Hispanic Unity and the Urban League earlier in well, in last year, one of the areas that really struck and gave, um, had resonated with each of you was the issue of education. And as you know, our chair is the vice chair of K-12, and I congratulate her on that um, at the state legislature. As a mother of two, it was definitely difficult for me to watch my own children navigate during the pandemic. Amidst the many staffing issues, school, school closures, quarantines, and the lack of of the inability to have the appropriate infrastructure to absolutely roll out what we needed in community, we still survived. Broward schools did everything that they could to ensure the fact that our students were able to move forward in a positive way. But I have to tell you that I stand here to just say and be clear that even though our children are doing well, we still have challenges related to a post-pandemic academic gap, particularly for black and brown students, not only in Broward County, but across the state of Florida. The state of Florida did not do testing for 2019 and 2020. However, the assessment scores in Broward County show a modest growth in learning gains. However, continued significant gaps in reading, language arts, and math among Black and Hispanic students still persists. But trust me, this is not a simple problem. 
it will require solutions that are multifaceted. Just very quick and high level, which you have in your document. In 2022, our math scores assessment level three and above, only 21% of black students are at a level three and above in math, ninth to 12th grade. That means 80% of our students are not performing at or above grade level in math. Compared to in 2018, it was only 31%. Not gonna spend a lot of time going through the data, but you have it in front of you. And this is similar for black and brown students across the state. But what I'm going to ask you to do as a Broward delegation is to know that this is not a Broward only issue. This is an issue that is across the state of Florida for black and brown students, particularly in urban areas. I will ask you to lock arms with other like-minded legislators, support our chairwoman, Representative Williams in her work in the K through 12 um, committee, because this is going to require a response that is not only policy, but is also appropriations. It's going to require a response that makes all of us, students, parents, elected officials, and other community stakeholders to come together in a way that we have never come together before. Because when our children are not reading and doing math at the levels that are proficient, that is my future workforce. That is your future workforce in a community that is a majority minority community. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to working with you. And as always, many of you have my cell phone number, feel free to use it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to continue to work with you to craft up something so that we could present to the state of Florida to assist this problem. And I want everyone to know that I allowed her additional time because this is such a major problem that we have here in the state of Florida. So I would like each and every one of us to work together to make something positive for Broward County. Thank you. Any questions for her? Okay. No questions. And if, after each speaker, we're going to ask if our members have any questions to actually meet them on the side so we continue on so that we will not hold you any longer than we necessarily have to. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, buenos dias. My name is Felipe Pinzon, President and CEO of the Hispanic Community of Florida. Our mission is to empower immigrants and others to become self-sufficient, productive, and civilly engaged. And for the past 40 years, we have served over 500,000 families with services and tools so they can learn English, get better jobs, and become contributing U.S. citizens. In return, uh, this new generation of Americans make a significant impact to the U.S. economy by boosting tax revenues, creating businesses that employ other people, and doing necessary jobs that provide critical services to all of us. We are, for sure, a one-stop American dream machine. And I know that firsthand. 22 years ago, I joined Hispanic community as a client upon moving to Broward County from, my, from Colombia. I learned the language, I got a better job, and I became a US citizen. And that's all thanks to Hispanic community. Flash forward to today, my job, my mission is to continue creating the same opportunities for thousands of immigrants, immigrants in Broward County. For this reason, I'm here today and I'm asking to respectfully support two appropriation project requests. These two requests will allow Hispanic community to grow our capacity in the workforce area and the well being mental health arena. I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to thank uh, Hispanic community's board, directors, chair, and secretary, and, and the staff members for joining me today. As always, uh, there is an open invitation for all of you. Thank you for being, as Dr. G said before, uh, Hispanic community back in June 2022 to hear more about the state of Hispanic um, and immigrant Broward and the state of Black Broward. We want you to come again and learn about the services that Hispanic community offers to the community. Uh, thank you, mil gracias, Red Woodson. Thank you so much for your continued support. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Um, at this point, we're going to call Mrs. Sharon Lawson and um, Child Net. Could you pair, prepare to come up? Thank you. 
Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Senators and Representatives of Florida. Um, my name is Sharon Lawson. Um, I am a registered dental hygienist licensed to provide services in the state of Florida for over 30 years. I'm a member of the Florida Dental Hygiene Association and the vice president of the South Florida Dental Hygiene Association for Broward County. On behalf of the FDHA, I ask for your support in increasing access to dental care for our state's most vulnerable residents. Legislation will be filed soon that makes minor changes to the 2011 Health Access Setting Law, which allows dental hygienists to perform certain services in specific settings without authorization or supervision of a dentist. This legislation would, number one, allow dental hygienists to apply temporary filling materials in these settings. Dental hygienists are already allowed to do this in private practice without supervision of a dentist. Number two, expand the locations mobile dental units may visit to bring dental care to underserved populations. Number three, remove unnecessary barriers to care in dental health access settings, such as prohibiting additional cleanings unless a child has been seen by a dentist in the last year. This legislation will be filed soon. We are working in conjunction with the Floridians for Dental Access and the American Children's Campaign on this initiative. Thank you for considering how Florida can expand oral education and care to children and adults across the state. Um, sincerely on the behalf of FDHA and SF SFDHA, Sharon Lawson. Um, my email is slawson at broward.edu. I'm a dental hygiene instructor at Broward College slawson at broward.edu. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them or answer them via email. Thank you very Thank much, ma'am. As she walks away, we have ChildNet and Art Broward coming. Thank you, Madam Chair. Larry Ryan, CEO for ChildNet, community-based care lead agency for Broward County since 2002, and the only community-based care lead agency in Broward County during that time. Um, my report today is a little bit better than it was a year ago. Um, things are improving from where we were. Um, our population number of children in foster care today is by far the lowest it has ever been in Broward County. We were just over 1600 children in care. And it's for good reasons. It's because of great work by the Broward Sheriff's Office and investigations. It's because of great work by providers funded by the Children's Services Council and Behavioral BBHC to do prevention services and provide services to families. It's because of great work on racial equity in an initiative led by the Urban League and the Broward County Commission. Um, we are at a good place there. Our workforce is actually moving in the right direction now. We were able, because our population is low, our finances are strong, and we were able to raise the starting salary for our dependency case managers to $50,000 a year. And that seems to be making a difference. So we are in a very good place on those things. But we got a lot more important work to do. Nowhere in the state of Florida has anybody yet figured out how to effectively serve the most complex and challenging kids. Teenagers that are served by multiple systems the Department of Juvenile Justice, Child Debt and the Department of Children and Families, the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Program of the Department of Children and Families. These children have complex needs. They have likely endured incredible trauma over their entire lives. And now as teenagers, we all struggle with how to serve them. Hopefully this year, we will work with the legislature to try to come up with innovative ways of blending our resources in a meaningful way. We all serve these children. They are really all our children. When somebody says it's a DJJ kid, it drives me crazy. No, it's a kid. And we need to serve these children together in meaningful and important ways and in innovative ways. We need to not do the things we've been doing for a hundred years and not getting good outcomes and not getting success. We need to be creative. We need to be innovative. We need to support our providers. We can do it. Thank you very much, sir. As he exits to the side, if you have any questions, our members, we ask you to meet him on the side. 
as she come forward, we're going to ask United Way and visit Fort Lauderdale to actually be prepared to come up. Good morning. I'm Julie Price, CEO of ARC Broward. Thank you, Chairperson Williams and the entire delegation for your ongoing support to issues that impact children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families. ARC Broward is Broward's only nationally accredited organization supporting 1,200 children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families annually by our 350 plus dedicated team members and this for the past 65 years. Today, we are asking for your continued support for two appropriation requests. Both of these are continued funding. The first for ARC Broward is through the Adults with Disabilities Program, funding that provides critical employment, post-secondary education and wraparound services for adults with developmental disabilities to prepare for and achieve successful employment in our community. The second is continued funding for a generator at Bark Housing, which is an intermediate care facility for 36 individuals with significant behavioral and medical challenges. Additional funding is required for this project as the costs have skyrocketed because of supply chain issues and the Agency for Healthcare's regulatory review process. The generator is critical to the health and safety of residents during emergencies and is required by ACA. And further, on behalf of the 300 other individuals that we serve through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities Waiver Program, the other thousands of individuals residing in Broward and the 25,000 people lingering on the waiting list, we ask for your continued support of the Medicaid Waiver I budget and requests for increases for, through that program as well. And Susan, do you have anything you wanted to add? If it's all right, Madam is it, Chair. Is it okay? I've been representing uh, ARC and many, many, uh, you all know me, many, many other organizations for the past, well, this is my 28th session. And I did serve on the legislature and I have to tell you, you guys should really be proud of yourselves. We in Broward County started so many of these programs that other counties have replicated. And we have brought you know, so many people to our area specifically for the programs that we have. And I just want to thank you for always fighting for us. I know how hard it is up there. I see a lot of you new faces. Some of were in the cities that, that I represented. And I'm so proud that you're up here, that you go up there and fight for us because we are a donor county. We bring a lot of taxes to the state of Florida. And a lot of times our cities don't see that come back to us. And we just have to keep fighting. And um, I'm, he I'm here to fight with you. And I'm, I'm now representing the city of Pompano with, with Yolanda. I mean, we have to be able to have some sort of parity to bring back some of what we contribute to the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. United Way, visit Fort Lauderdale and Lighthouse of Broward, prepare to come. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and good morning, members of the Broward Legislative Delegation. Happy New Year. Uh, so glad to be here with you all today. My name is Nasby Chowdhury, Director of Public Policy with United Way of Broward County. Uh, when we met in December, I had a brief moment and opportunity to share with you our United Way of Florida legislative agenda for 2023. And what uh, Ms. Sidney Wilson just passed out is our 2023 consensus legislative agenda for United Way of Broward County. This is a document that our organization puts together every year with the full collaboration and participation of our public policy advisory committee. Many members who are with us in the room today, such as Hispanic Community of Florida, Urban League of Broward County, Children's Services Council, and uh, several more. Uh, but really, we put together this document after kind of taking a look at what our county is currently in need of. And a lot of these issues you have become familiar with. You understand that residents in your uh, districts need dire, dire help with. And of course, we are here to serve as a resource to you in any way possible uh, that we can. Um, additionally, if you'd like a full scope of kind of the full ALICE report, which again stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and Employed, uh, you'll see that there's a very cool QR code on the front of the document. And if you scan that, you'll get the full-on 
uh, Alice report for Florida, which kind of goes through how the data was gathered and, and how a lot of this uh, has been put together for you all. So uh, really, that is all I have to share with you all today. Of course, I'm looking forward to meeting with you all in your offices here and in Tallahassee during committee weeks and during session. Uh, and just to share with you a couple of dates really quickly, I'll also uh, pass along those to Ms. Andrew Knowles-Hill so she can share that with you all. First is our United Way of Florida Capital Days. That's going to be hosted February 21st and 22nd. It is during the committee week, right after President's Day. So very much uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. And then the second day is our inaugural Alice Summit, which will be a week after Tuesday, February 28th. We'll be very much so looking forward to seeing you all there as well. That'll be hosted here in Broward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Lighthouse of Broward, United Way, Stacy, visit Fort Lauderdale. I didn't see you. Okay. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Is that weird? Okay. Good morning, honorable delegation members. My name is Jillian Gonzalez, and I am the Vice President of Operations at the Lighthouse of Broward County for the Blind and Visually Impaired. We are proud to be your sole provider of rehabilitative services in our community for nearly 50 years. Our services are intended to maximize independence by teaching critical life skills, such as assistive technology, self-advocacy, orientation and mobility, workforce training, and activities of daily living. It is important to note that our services are free of charge, so there is no access barrier to care. In front of you, there are collateral materials for your reference and referrals should you have anyone personally or professionally in need of our services. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to our Vice President of Development, Jose Lopez. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Madam Chair and members of the delegation. It's an honor to be here. I have to excuse myself. I normally am with my guide dog, Louis. He did so well today, so I'm with my second partner here, my Kate. Um, I want to share with you really our concern that we uh, experienced after COVID. We see that our senior population is still uh, suffering most. And uh, look, uh, Based on lack of funding, we are unfortunately not able to help everybody. To put it in perspective, um, last year we were able to serve 231 seniors in Broward County. Sounds good, but 177,000 members in our community are blind or visually impaired. And again, we are unfortunately not able to support them at all. This is also the reason that uh, we uh, requested your support for the appropriation request to serve more people. With your funding, your support and your help, we will be able to serve 50% more seniors next year and now. And everybody gets a nice brochure with a lot of information and it's important, of course, but I want to tell you, I went through the program. I know what it is being blind, starting from one day to another. Um, in my case, uh, I had the privilege to be a vice secretary of justice for the government of Venezuela until 1996, head of the embassy in Germany, and for one day to another, boom, I lost my eyesight. I came to Broward County, I found a place called the Lighthouse. Lighthouse, I came and without no other perspective, no, really frustrated and depressed. And then again, I can tell you, Lighthouse changed life. Years later, I'm here today. I'm a proud member of this community, especially Deerfield Beach. I'm a proud graduate from Leadership Broad, by the way, together with Andrea, <laughs> same class. And um, I've served my community and I know we together can save and change life. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give my classmate a hand. <laughs> it's a point of privilege. We excel, right, Jose? All right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was September 25th, but thank you. Our chair had to step out for a moment. Um, junior achievement, Chaz and Casey. Chaz is not here, but Jenny Chalkin, one of our board members, is here. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Delapena. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of development for Junior Achievement of South Florida based in lovely Coconut Creek. Uh, for those I do not know, um, it's great to meet you. Unfortunately, our CEO, Lori Salarulo, who many of you know, uh, was traveling and couldn't make today's meeting. However, I'm here to graciously thank all of you for your continued support of Junior Achievement. 
along with the other various amazing nonprofit organizations here in Broward. And a very special thanks to Tina Polsky and Christine Hunchowski who continue to support us. So thank you very much. We appreciate you. As many of you may know, junior achievement empowers our youth with the knowledge, ability, and confidence to navigate their futures, drive our economy, and lead our community. Our volunteer delivered K-12 programs foster work readiness, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy skills. JA's experiential learning inspires kids to dream big and reach their potential. Last school year, Junior Achievement of South Florida served nearly 70,000 local students, the vast majority of which live here in Broward. To that end, I would like to personally invite all of you who have never been out to visit JA World in Coconut Creek to show you where the magic happens. Christine knows, I see you smiling. We'll be in touch with all of you within the next few weeks. Please give consideration to visiting us in the near future, and we'd love to have you. Again, thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to helping create the future for the youth of Broward County. I also borrow Jenny Chakran, one of my personal favorite JA board members. Uh, she's a senior VP at First Horizon Bank. Jenny. Good morning, everyone. Um, last year, I got to meet many of you when you came to Junior Achievement for this meeting, and it was fantastic. So I just want to reiterate uh, what Casey said. If you haven't been, or if you're a new member of the delegation, which I know several of you are and I've met you, please, please, please let us know. We'd love to have you and I will try to come in and, and help out with the tour when you come. I want to uh, just kind of share with you, I've been on the board of directors at Junior Achievement since 2020, right when the pandemic started. That's when I joined the board, so really crazy. Um, and I really care about our relationship with the um, with our public officials. And a few years ago, I was asked to become the chair of the Governmental uh, Affairs Committee, which is why you will see me a lot. Um, but hopefully it's a partnership and it's a joint partnership and I can help you as much as we ask you for help. So I also wanna thank uh, Representative Hachowski and um, Polsky for all of your support and in initiating and work with the appropriation and sponsoring the appropriation. And I wanna just leave you with this, financial literacy in children leads to economic stability for us. That's what Junior Achievement is all about. Thank you. Were there any questions for any, anyone? Awesome, thank you. Now to one of the best universities that exists in our area. I'm a proud owl. As our chair steps out, I had a moment to say that. <laughs> Ryan Britton, FAU, go owls. Oh, thank you very much. I can't meet, I can't meet that introduction. That's perfect. It's uh, very good to see all of you. My name is Ryan Britton. I'm the executive director of government relations for Florida Atlantic University. Go Owls. Hopefully everyone's watching our basketball team, which in about a week should be a top 25 nationally ranked basketball team. We're really excited about that. Um, it is an exciting time at the university. I'll be brief and uh, respectful of everyone's time. But there is a time of transition upon us at FAU. President Kelly announced his uh, resignation and his retirement uh, last year. On December 31st, he officially retired. And interim president, Dr. Stacey Volnick, took up the helm of FAU uh, on January 1st. FAU is in great hands. Dr. Volnick is a 30-year administrator at FAU and a three-time alumna of the university. She knows the university inside and out. And while this is a time of transition, we are in no means taking our feet off the gas. This is something that we are continuing to push forward. We're pursuing aggressive agendas. And for hopefully many of you are aware of the great successes we've had of late at the university. We have made huge strides. President Kelly, uh, his leadership had us ranked nationally as one of the best uh, universities in the country by US News and World Report. For the first time in our school's history, we're ranked number 32 among all public, uh, 132 among all public uh, universities in the country. We've doubled our graduation rates. We have doubled our research expenditures. We have made huge strides in athletics, student achievement across the board. Every element of the university is heading in the right direction. And one of the things we're most proud of is many of those strides, specifically around student achievement, graduation rates and retention rates, we've done so with absolutely no equity gaps. We are Florida's most diverse university. We are a Hispanic serving institution and everyone at FAU achieves. Our Black, African-American, and Hispanic students actually graduate at a rate higher than our general student population. And that is unique nationally and something we are incredibly proud of. And so we look forward to continuing to serve our students well. As we transition to 2023, 
a lot of our legislative requests, which we'll come to talk to you about in Tallahassee, will focus in the healthcare sector. As you know, Florida's population continues to explode. We have heard the needs of the community. We're facing physician shortages, nursing shortages, social workers, affiliated healthcare professions. So we're going to pursue all of that, as well as a college of dentistry, which we're asking the Board of Governors to approve in January. So we thank you all so much for your support, here to be a resource to you. And if we can help in any way, please let us know. Thanks. Thank any you. questions for our employees? Nope. Okay, Brucey Cummings, followed by Robert Sierra Club. Here? Okay. Adrian Barman? I could be Adrian. Okay. <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> okay. Susan Steinhauser. Okay. Thank you. Hey, everybody, um, and Happy New Year. It is so great to see some of you here for the first time. You freshmen, congratulations. Um, I'm not here on behalf of just Sierra or just Climate Reality or, or any environmental organization. I'm here today as a Coconut Creek resident who is really concerned because I live near Monarch Hill Landfill. And last night I had the pleasure of participating in a meeting in Coconut Creek City Chambers about Coconut Creek's vulnerability assessment. And that's like a buzzword, right? Vulnerability assessment. The county has one, every city has one. If they don't have one, they're going to develop one. And it's generally about dealing with the impacts of climate change called adaptation. What are we going to do about sea level rise? What are we going to do about increased rainfall? What are we going to do about more thunderous storms? And how are we going to deal with that? And first thing I want to do is thank Representative Hunchowski for filing HB 111, slip bill, because we need to stop building with our public funds structures that are already prone to sea level rise and dangers and flooding. But aside from the adaptation side of climate change, we need to slow it down. And had we done this 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we would not need the adaptation that we have right now, the same measures. So let's slow down our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, we typically talk about carbon emissions and we want electric vehicles very important, but we don't talk about methane. Methane, 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide at the onset of warming our atmosphere, is generated by organic matter. One of the sources is organic matter sitting in the landfill. Monarch Hill is near capacity. We're talking about building an incinerator to burn our garbage, burn our plastic, burn our organics. How about we just slow down what goes to the landfill? So although Monarch Hill is governed at the county level, I propose to all of you sitting here that the state legislature and everybody sitting behind me, I propose that the state legislature can have an impact on what goes into the landfill. There are plenty of people who have been talking about plastics, so I'm not going to go on that route. Other people will talk about that. I'm talking about organic matter. I'm talking about the banana peel. I'm talking about the coffee grounds that can be composted. Instead of having this methane go into our atmosphere, I'm proposing that we follow the lead of other states, one state in particular, that passed a law where composting is mandatory. That wouldn't necessarily fly in the state of Florida, but there are pieces of that legislation that we can take, and I truly believe would have bipartisan support, that we can support our farmers by providing them compost, create jobs, to gather this compost and create it and slow down the emissions that are accelerating climate change. And if anybody has any questions, I will be there for about five minutes. It is so nice to, just to see some of the legislatures that, legislators I've never seen in person before. So, I, and please make sure you get your Sierra calendar. That's on behalf of Adrian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, client, who, who, Number 16, okay, Campbell Properties. Nami is on deck. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Evan Bradley and I'm the CFO of Campbell Property Management. 
We employ over 900 people and serve more than 40,000 homeowners in your districts. We also belong to a broader industry of some 18,000 licensed professionals who work with more than 6 million Florida homeowners across the state of Florida who are dedicated to protecting the high quality of life and affordable cost of living that leads so many to call our state home. However, those two pillars of Florida living, cost of living and quality of life are under great stress these days that due to factors that are either one, complicated and somewhat beyond your control, or two, very simple and well within your control. For example, the availability of property insurance is a very complicated issue and not something you can or will be able to resolve overnight. Thank you for your efforts at this special legislative session to address that issue. We hope to see some relief for our homeowners who simply cannot afford the unsustainably high rates for property insurance in Florida and the compounding year over year double digit increases. That's if they can obtain insurance and all insurance at all in the current environment. However, my focus today is on the two lesser known causes <clears throat> for cost increases to our homeowners that we well within your control during the 2023 legislative session for which your help is needed. First is the Surfside Law. The first cost increase we are already seeing across our state is the implementation of the recent Surfside legislation. For example, the 2022 Surfside Law now forces condo owners to pay for building maintenance under newly mandated, costly, one-size-fits-all uh, reserve studies and funding methods that will require higher than necessary assessments in the highly prescriptive way in which the new law was written. We hope you will pass sensible legislation that will incorporate recommendations from our industry to clean up much of that well-intended new law so condo owners are not priced out of their homes, particularly our fixed income seniors. The second issue is estoppel certificates. This is a second cost increase that is entirely avoidable and thankfully it's not taking place yet. Nevertheless, it is a threat and we're asking you to be aware of and oppose any effort to eliminate the statutory right of our communities or their management companies to recover costs for the preparation and delivery of an estoppel certificate. Eliminating our long-standing legal right to be paid for services rendered would result in passing on those costs in the form of even higher assessments on already struggling homeowners. The estoppel fee should only ever be paid by those who order the service and therefore legally owe and pay for the service, which is the title agent on behalf of their clients. Although no legislation has yet been filed, we believe it will be filed for the 2023 session. If so, we ask that you oppose it and defeat it soundly. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, sir. Mission United is on deck. We're next or no? You, you are next. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, delegates. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I am Sandra Comper Boynton, Executive Director of NAMI Broward County. And with me is Marilyn Lieberman, our NAMI advocate. Uh, I stand before you today to speak on behalf of the Alliance representing the voices of peers living with mental illness, their families and caregivers. I would like to address an important new service that for the first time gives people easy access to mental health care and suicide prevention. 988, the new three digit number for the suicide and crisis lifeline is an open door. Since July 16, 2022, anyone can call, chat, or text to 988 in English or Spanish and speak with a life call taker who is trained to help people during behavioral health uh, crisis. Veterans can also use that number to call. The 988 Lifeline Centers, combined with mobile response teams and crisis receiving facilities, give our communities a safer, less dramatic, and more economical way to access behavioral health care. As a mental health professional, I have worked with many families in crisis and even within my own family. I can assure you today that 988 is the answer to many families' prayers. We're thankful to the Florida legislator for allocating temporary federal resources last year to strengthen the state's 988 lifeline centers. I'm also grateful to you for approving a second increase in recurring funds for behavioral health services in this year's state budget, including the expansion of mobile response teams. Broward County on, uh, 
Broward Behavioral Health Coalition, our managing entity, is using these funds to add one new mobile response team, making it a total of four teams in Broward County. We're so grateful. My ask to you today is to continue your support to expand our community-based crisis response system. Going forward, let's work together to identify a source of sustainability to funding for 988 in this county. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. At this time, we have uh, Mission Be Mission United on deck. Oh, 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 on deck, on deck. Can we do roll call for this, please? Thank you. <laughs> At this time, we're going to have roll call because we have a. a two local bills, three, three local bills and three annexations to do. And we must have a quorum that we could do those. So I think we have a quorum at this time. And if so, we're gonna go ahead and take care of that. Senator Polsky, Senator Osgood, Senator Book, Representative Hans Chopsky. Here. Representative Daly. Here. Representative Dunkley. Representative Campbell. Here. Representative Lamarca. Representative Cassell. Here. Representative Gottlieb. Representative Barberman. Representative Robinson. Representative Woodson. Vice Chair Pizzo. Chair Williams. Here. Have four. Thank you very much. At this time, we ask that counselor to read the local bill one, two, and possibly three, and also for annexation. Local Bill 1, a bill to be entitled an act relating to Broward County, providing a short title, creating an independent special district to provide and fund senior services throughout Broward County, providing for a governing body to be known as the Senior Services Council of Broward County, providing for such council's membership, powers and duties, and budget procedures, authorizing the levy of ad valorem taxes not to exceed one half mil, providing for additional district powers, duties, responsibilities, and obligations, providing for dissolution of the district, providing for a referendum and ballot question, providing effective dates. That's the first local bill. Thank you, sir. Can we ask the member to explain the bill, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so many of you are familiar with this bill. I've uh, been able to, been fortunate to sponsor it the last couple of years and, and others have before me. Um, I want to point out that the short title on this bill is actually the Edith Schaefer Letterberg Senior Services Act in honor of Edith Schaefer Letterberg, a longtime advocate uh, for uh, seniors in, in our community. My hope is that this will finally be uh, the year. Uh, it's the same bill that we had uh, last year, and I would ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have any questions, members? No questions? Anyone would like to speak from the audience on the bill? Thank you, Madam you Chair. Good, how are you? It's good to see everyone up here. Devin West, Broward County Intergovernmental Affairs. I just wanna thank Representative Daly for carrying this again for us. It is a priority of Broward County and uh, we look forward to your favorable support and I will waive the rest of my time. If you have any questions, just let me know. Rep Daly, would you like to close on the bill? Wave close on. Thank you. Paul roll, please. On the matter of the Broward County Senior Services Council local bill, Senator Polsky, yeah. Senator Osgood, Senator Book, Rep Hunchovsky, yes, Rep Daly, yes, Rep Dunkley, yes, Rep Campbell, yes, Rep Lamarca, Rep Cassell, yes, Rep Gottlieb, Rep Bartleman, Rep Robinson, Rep Woodson, Vice Chair Pizzo, Chair Williams, yes, it passes unanimously with those present. Thank you very much, Madam. Second bill, please. Our second bill, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the Sunshine Water Control District, Broward County, codifying, reenacting, amending, and repealing the district charter, providing legislative intent, providing for continuation of authority for revenue collection and powers to meet outstanding obligations, providing a definition, repealing chapter 63-609, and 2021-255 laws of Florida and chancery decree number 62-4596-F relating to the district, providing an exception to general law, providing an effective date. That is our second local bill. 
Thank you very much, sir. Rev. Daly, would you like to explain your bill, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this is not the same bill uh, related to Sunshine Water Control District that I brought the last four years. I thought you guys would be more excited. Um, with your support, we passed that last year. This is a separate bill, um, and it's basically the unintended consequence of the governor's fight with the Reedy Creek District and Disney, uh, the mouse. Uh, because of that change in law during that special session, uh, the Sunshine Water Control District, which is in my district, uh, and does a great job, was one of the unintended consequences. They, they were dissolved and will be dissolved by June 1st, uh, 2023, if we don't pass this. Uh, I'd like to recognize the chair, Joe Marrero, who's in the audience, a longtime friend and constituent, does a great job on the board. They have been providing services since 1963 and need our help to continue to do so. Uh, so this bill simply ratifies, confirms, and approves continuation of the district so that it is not dissolved on June 1st, 2023. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Any members with questions? Anyone from the audience that would like to have something? Come in. Just briefly, Madam Chair, my name is Chris Lyon with the law firm of Lewis, Longman & Walker. Uh, we serve as general counsel for the district as well as legislative counsel. We thank Representative Daly for agreeing to sponsor the bill. Uh, would request your support, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you very much, sir. No others? Call the roll, please. On Sunshine Water District. I'm sorry. They closed the door. <laughs> he waved closed just for the record. Senator Polsky? Senator Osgood, Senator Book, Representative Hunchovsky? Yes. Representative Daly? Yes. Representative Dunkley? Yes. Representative Campbell? Yes. Representative Lamarca? Representative Cassell? Yes. Representative Gottlieb? Representative Bartleman? Yes. Representative Robinson? Representative Woodson? Yes. Vice Chair Pizzo? Chair Williams? Yes. Unanimous, uh, passage unanimous with those present. <coughs> Thank you very much. Have um, third bill, please read. Thank you. Local bill number three for today, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the town of Southwest Ranches, Broward County, providing an exception to general law, prohibiting the sale and use of fireworks located within the town of Southwest Ranches, providing an exception and applicability, providing an effective date. That is the local bill. Thank you, sir. Rep. Bolleman, please. Yes, uh, I'm bringing this bill back again because it's very important to the town of Southwest Ranches, which is a rural agrarian municipality. I think you've all driven by it. Uh, there are 75. Uh, fireworks uh, are killing the horses on the farms. So what this bill does is actually it gives a little local control back to the town so they can go ahead and govern themselves and decide what they're gonna do in terms of how they're going to regulate fireworks in their community. It mirrors a bill that was filed in Palm Beach. So I'm hoping this year we'll get this through. So I ask for all of your support. Thank you. Any questions from members? Any questions in the audience? Any have, you have something you would like to say? Oh. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the delegation. My name is Andy Burns. I am the town administrator in Southwest Ranches. I know that you're pressed for time today, but I do want to thank Representative Bartleman for her bringing this bill back. It is something that is very important for, to us. I want to thank you for your consideration. I'm here for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Call the roll. You want to close? Um, please close. Thank you. Call the roll, please. On the matter of the uh, town of Southwest Ranches, local bill, Senator Polsky, Senator Osgood, Senator Book. Representative Hunchovsky? Yes. Representative Daly? Representative Dunkley? Yes. Representative Campbell? Yes. Representative Lamarca? Representative Casale? Yes. Representative Gottlieb? Representative Bartleman? Yes. Representative Robinson? Representative Woodson? Vice Chair Pizzo? Chair Williams? Yes. Passes with those present unanimous. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we have a time certain for our sheriff. Um, it's 11.30, look at the clock, it is that time. So we will come back for any section as soon as he's done. Good morning, ma'am, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to get this time. Um, it's nice to see that we're able to be punctual despite all the traffic. Uh, even the sheriff has to comply with traffic laws. Uh, to all our community members here today, uh, it's a delight for me to kind of give you all an update on some of the partnership elements that's been good in terms of the legislative uh, efforts that you all have been able to do for us. 
the quick recap, uh, coming off of 2022, there were some very important legislative items that we needed to see pushed up in Tallahassee that would support our efforts out here to safeguard Broward County. Uh, and one success that this body had from our legislative element was to get up there and reform and modify some of the traffic um, enforcement laws that we had, which was important. Um, and ironically, we're right around the corner from another event that occurs almost on an annual basis here in Broward County, which is this unsanctioned wheels up, guns down event where it creates an enormous amount of chaos uh, and confusion within the community consistently every year. Uh, and I know that legislative item was able to pass uh, in conjunction work with Senator Book and many others to get that executed. We look forward to enforcing that law this upcoming week or so. Um, in addition, CPIS or Child Protective Investigative Services is in a partnership relationship with the Department of Children and Families, uh, a contract or partnership element that's, that exists since 1999. And there has been a multitude of different funding issues or concerns that we had there. And we had an opportunity to work with our legislative group here uh, to identify ways to keep and retain some of the funding elements that exist within that grant. Uh, for example, there was a time where we were no longer or one was unable to keep funding if we did not use it all. And fortunately, you all were able to work that out. And I say you all because uh, although individual champions take on different initiatives for us, I always recognize this as a team effort. Uh, and we are now able to roll over that 8% and help fund our investigators who are really taking care of one of our most viable assets, which was our children. The last thing I wanna highlight, uh, although it was vetoed uh, by the governor, but the interest and the efforts to help support our digital forensic unit here. For those who are not familiar in the community, we pre pretty much the Broward Sheriff's Office is executing all investigative elements when it comes to crime labs, DNA, digital evidence, all these different things for the entire county, uh, not just for the Broward Sheriff's Office. And keep in mind, we have a multitude of different uh, law enforcement uh, organizations here. In 2023, some of the things I just wanna highlight that it's going to be an important element for us and we hope to continue to have the partnership. We've already talked to individual representatives or senators about some of these things, but I wanna highlight it again. Um, we need to really focus from a state standpoint on designating our 911 telecommunicating specialists into the special risk categories because they are true first responders. This has been something that from day one, uh, when I walked in office in January 11th of 2019, I had uh, received as a priority from my staff, from my union members, and I 100% agree with it. Uh, although we have not been successful yet, I can tell you having worked with my colleagues and peers at the Florida Sheriff's Association, I'm continuing to hammer at this and we're starting to change the narrative. Uh, what does that mean out of the 66 plus counties and sheriffs that we had? When I first brought this to the attention, it was, you know, we had about four or five sheriffs that would support it. Uh, and now we have about 15 sheriffs that are supporting this uh, effort. Uh, there was a lot of concern uh, from that particular body with the Florida Sheriff's Association about how that would impact uh, FRS, law enforcement retirement. And we've done all type of data analytics that suggest we can get this done and it's the right thing to do. The Broward Sheriff's Office had the largest public safety telecommunications group in the state. Uh, and this impact us more than anyone else. So I look forward to fighting with you all for that. Uh, in addition, we're hoping that we can kind of rectify some things that occurred in the past under different administrations up in Tallahassee uh, with the rollback of our FRS or our deputies, correctional officers, firefighters from 60 back to 55 uh, in years of service from 30 to 25. This is really interesting, and I'm glad we have a lot of participants from the community because uh, one of the things I do often is a lot of independent research. I'm a doctorate student and I'm constantly navigating through new ways and how do we help our people. And one of the things we recently discovered that the average life expectancy for first responders, law enforcement officers is 59. Doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter any other variable. Uh, whereas the standard life expectancy here in the United States for an adult male is 76 years of age and for a woman is 81. But yet, if you're a first responder, we're knocking off a significant portion of your life expectancy. And our retirement system, as it is, has only given us a short period of time to enjoy that retirement. Now, I'm somewhat of a young guy. I got some more time to go. Uh, but I have a good group of law enforcement officers, first responders, correctional deputies, et cetera, who are going to fall into retirement. And I'd hate to see uh, that this standard that is set um, at 60 years of age continue to be the baseline numbers that we picked out. I'm gonna go really quickly because I know I only have 10 minutes, but 
Also looking at the continued support for our real-time crime center, that was a significant thing to be able to look for funding. I know we, we had some successes and we can't control what the governor does and veto and knock down at times, but that is something that's significant for this community. For those behind me who are not familiar with the real-time crime center, it's a state-of-the-art uh, command center that we built out as a byproduct of what we learned after Stoneman Douglas, giving us access to pretty much 19,000 camera systems across 265 plus different schools in our system. And over the last uh, several years, we've been able to have 3,000 plus investigations. We have literally stopped the next shooter here. Uh, we had an individual who was following the path from MSD, prepping all the different signs and indicators and had not been for our threat management unit consistently working and evaluating these cases, we probably would be you know, dealing with another tragedy here. So that it paid for itself, it speaks for itself, continue support in our Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, Digital Forensics, our cold case unit, which we also enacted in 2019. We're now solving crimes. We had over about 350 cold cases that were sitting in boxes. And to me, that was an injustice in itself. So we committed manpower. We're solving these cases. We solved the serial killer case that took place in the 1990s here. We were able to track down an individual uh, who was slaughtering women and vacated uh, to Brazil and solve these cases, so significant. Uh, one of the things that I kind of just want to talk about, uh, success elements and remind the community that we want to get their participation. I talked about the Real-Time Crime Center. As we initially started that and focus on our schools, we start understanding that our houses of worship and businesses could also benefit by having us be able to hit a button, access the cameras and see live feed uh, as ter in terms of any threat that may be taking place. We now have a public-private partnership. You can go on our website. Um, I don't care how small of a business it is or how big of a business it is. Uh, we like to have access to it, be able to provide this service to you. And it's very uh, marginal fees, if any. Uh, we're talking about basic setup stuff. Lastly, uh, I'll kind of wrap up and start act, you know, taking some questions from you. There has been somewhat of uh, discussion lately in the media about communication systems. This is something that continues to occur here in Broward County and these dialogues are non-ending. Uh, we have a lot, we've had a lot of success with our communications um, centers, but we have a lot more work to do. There's been some concern as to whether or not the sheriff, uh, I didn't recently sign an extension agreement. That means absolutely nothing to this community because we're gonna be showing up, answering these calls, whether this contract is signed or not. Uh, we're continuing to negotiate with the county administrator, look like we're making some good progress on it. Uh, but the importance behind making sure we get this contract right is because it impacts my personnel ability to have management control and make real time decisions that impact public safety. And so we need to get that right. It just can't continue to be extended. I think this would have been our 10th extension, uh, whereas we have not gotten this done yet. So I, I have to make sure I hold the line on there. With that, we have a lot of good things going on here in Broward County. Crime rates are down uh, in all of our major uh, category areas. We're still tackling some different uh, initiatives and things that we need to do for community service, but ultimately we got a good, um, a good start to the year, and I think we'll continue to roll through the entire year. With that, ma'am, I'll turn over the time and perhaps answer any questions that you all have for me. Thank you very much, sir. Do any of our members have any questions? Rep. Duncan? Thank you so much, Sheriff Tony, for um, briefing us today yes, and for you and your team and, you know, keeping a safe Broward. I wanted to ask where you mentioned about um, the program that you're starting that has started with um, other organizations partnering um, to be able to be safe as well. Um, how is that partnership going? And also, um, what is the response that you've been getting and how is it? How, are, how is the sheriff's department sending that out so others know about it outside of your website? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll tell you, we're doing very well. Uh, I talked about when we started this element for the schools, we had easily roll into about 19,000 cameras, and we currently have 24,000 camera systems that we're accessing or have the ability to access. So that shows within the last year when we started this uh, official campaign to educate the community marketing that for social media, sending out mailers, getting um, people's attention to be able to join this, that we've had an increase of almost 5,000 plus cameras in just a year. So I think if we can continue to spread that message, let the community know about it, continue to highlight it, um, I, I would anticipate that the numbers are only gonna grow and we have the capacity to take on more. Yes, ma'am. Rep. Ballerman, you had a question? 
Okay, anyone from the audience? No questions? Yes, ma'am. No, okay. Um, we're here on behalf of the legislators of Delaware, Dermot McCleary. We'd like to know your view on that and if other sheriffs sure. in our state would join together, law enforcement would join together to oppose. Sure. This bill. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll tell you my position at first, which is I absolutely 100,000 plus 10% disagree with it. Um, I have worked with let me get out while I'm ahead. Have a good day. Uh, I have. Can you repeat her question so we can have. Put yes. The, the question was whether or not the sheriff, myself, or the office and, and its entity would support current legislation that is going to Tallahassee that prohibits or goes against being able to have an open carry state like Texas. Uh, and that's, again, a 1,000 plus percent no. Uh, I have too much experience behind dealing with mass shootings, dealing with active shooter events. I've talked to other colleagues as I'm a member of the major county sheriffs of the United States Association, which represents about 66 of the largest sheriffs that we have in the United States. There's only 3,100 of us. This is the biggest group. This is your LA, your Cook County. Uh, and ironically enough, having talked to colleagues who are sheriffs in good old Texas, they are in opposition of it. I've talked to some ones who are rational, understand it, they share their experiences of dynamics of calls coming out that, hey, we have uh, someone walking through a school campus ground with a rifle slung over their shoulder. That creates an alarm and activation of a thousand different variables that are not good for public safety, confidence, and the, just the overall feeling of, hey, we're in a good climate. So I hope that answers this first part. The second part of our question was to whether or not there are other sheriffs that would support that. And I would tell you, you know, the thing I noticed most in my 18 years in law enforcement, uh, just reaching four years as your sheriff just two days ago, is that we are very divided in this state once we pass Orlando. Um, and I heard a yeah, right? Once we, it just, the dynamics change, the philosophical approach, the politics and everything else. So I would, I would imagine, ma'am, that we are not going to get every sheriff to support that because some of my colleagues or peers in the North agree with the sentiments that we should have open carry. So, you know, I'm going to fight here for Broward. Uh, I'll represent us as the best I can in the interest of this community, and I won't, you know, waver in my commitment to that. Thank you very much. Rep. Gottley. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Sheriff, you know, I think you're doing a great job when we talk often. Um, my question is, I don't think the legislature is going to do an open carry bill. I think they're going to do what they call a permitless carry bill. And obviously, there's, there's a difference. Do you know is there? I'm not going to ask you your position on that, but do you know... Is there a united front on the, the Sheriff's Association or the local chiefs or anything as it relates to permit miscarry? Uh, you know, I don't want to speak without having confirmed it, but, you know, sharing and, and talking to our chiefs of police here, we all have the same sentiment in that we currently have a process of a, what it requires to have a permit here in the state. It's managed through the Department of Agriculture. What is the necessity for mitigating that? responsibility of doing background checks, verifications, mental health examinations, and all these things that have a nexus to every single shooting we have in this country. Every mass shooting we have, it's a cookie cutter response. It's a cookie cutter. You know, there were signs and symptoms that this person had some type of issue. All of a sudden they got access to a firearm. All of a sudden the, the law enforcement missed all these telltale signs. So let's keep the checks and balance and expand on it. Uh, I don't think we need to reduce you know, our due diligence to safeguard this community, whether it be through legislation or through our law enforcement practices. Appreciate your advocacy. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Sheriff, for all you do. We appreciate you and thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you all. If you need me, I'm here. At this time, we're going to call a roll because we need a quorum to vote on the bill. Annexation. For annexation, uh, roll call, Senator Polsky, Senator Osbitt, Senator Book. Representative Hans Chopsky? Here. Representative Daly? Representative Dunkley? Here. Representative Campbell? Here. Representative Lamarca? Representative Cassell? Here. Representative Gottlieb? Here. Representative Bartleman? Representative Robinson? Representative Woodson? Here. Vice Chair Pizzo? Chair Williams? Here. We have four. Thank you very much, Madam. Mr. Attorney? Our first ordinance, ordinance number 2022-005. 
an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Dania Beach, Florida, authorizing by voluntary petition the annexation of land, 22425 square feet located between Anglers Avenue, also known as Ravenswood Road, and Southwest 22nd Avenue, Southwest 42nd Street, and Southwest 39th Street, which real property is owned by SMS of South Florida Incorporated, a Florida corporation, into the corporate limits of the city of Dania Beach, Florida, pursuant to section 171.044 Florida statutes and providing a legal description of the property subject to the voluntary annexation, providing for public publication of notice, providing for filings with the appropriate governmental agencies, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, further providing for an effective date. That is our first annexation for today. Thank you, sir. Do we have any comments or speakers that would like to speak on the issue? Good morning. I'm the city attorney for City of Dania Beach, and I just wanted to say thank you for your support. Thank you, sir. Hi, Josh. Good morning, legislators. Josh Freeman and uh, LSN Partners on behalf of the uh, property owner seeking the voluntary annexation. Um, this is the most benign request I think you'll get all day, so I appreciate your support. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Attorney? Fine. Okay, call the roll, please. Is a, a, annexations take a voice vote. So uh, all in favor, say yay. Yay. Any opposed? The measure is approved. Next, Next one, Mr. Attorney. Our second annexation for today, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the city of Parkland, Broward County, annexing into the corporate limits of the city of Parkland an approximately 3.83 acre parcel of contiguous land located in unincorporated Broward County, providing an effective date. That is the annexation. Thank you, um, Rep. Sponsor. Rep. Did you want to speak on the annexation? I just wanted to thank the city of Parkland for working with us. Andrea, thank you for all the work you've done on this and the attorneys. And this should be the simplest thing. We're <laughs> thank you. Any speakers? Any members? Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, Liz Summerstein Adler. I'm an attorney at Green School Martyr here on behalf of the property owner that submitted the request. Just appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see, see you all. Thank you for all you do. My name is Rich Walker. I'm the mayor for the city of Parkland. And obviously, we would appreciate your support. And thank you very much, Representative Pontasi. Commissioner. <laughs> Bob Mayerson, Commissioner, City of Parkland. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Call the roll, please. An, an annexation is a voice vote. All in favor? Say yay. 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 Any opposed? The measure is approved. Thank you very much. At this time, we're going to call Mission, Mission United, which was on deck. And after Mission United, we have Step Up for Students should be on deck. Good morning, Madam Chair, delegation, staff, and guests. Uh, my name is Stella Tokar, CEO of Bold Consulting and Coaching and happy Friday 13th. After, <laughs> after 41 years in the political arena, uh, as an advocate, a lobbyist, a paid staff member, I'm really happy to continue my public service with United Way Broward as the public policy chairwoman for the uh, public the committee for the next couple of years. And as the wife of a vet, I'm passionate about our military community and what they go through in transition. So I'm proud of the work for the past 10 years on uh, Leadership Council of Mission United, uh, who takes care of the active duty member transitioning back into civ uh, civilian life. That brings me to the report that I've submitted uh, electronically to the office, as well as in person uh, for the committee meeting today. And it brings highlight to a report that was filed with the FDVA last year after a whole year of fact finding on behalf of the state of women veterans in the state of Florida. 
The assessment findings and recommendations were based on face-to-face -face meetings with the women veterans throughout the state, Panhandle to South Florida, and virtual meetings, surveys, and phone calls. Uh, the committee did such a great job and it was submitted to FDVA, General Hartzell, the director, took it to the governor's office. They discussed it and the work was so impactful that they are going to continue the, uh, the fact-finding committee to become a permanent advisory council for the next five years and continue the good work. And I'm really proud to be appointed one of those seven women. With that in mind, the work was divided into four subcommittees. Uh, the Deborah Sampson Act, which is federal law that trickles down into Florida, uh, January of 2021, looking at the healthcare benefits and uh, the status of women uh, overall. Homelessness, outreach, communication systems, and point of entry, it's really difficult to find women veterans. So we're looking to find them to serve them and the veterans home. There were a lot of uh, reports and backup that are in your files that were used for this report. The work continues. So we'll be in conversation in and out of session. And I look forward to partnering with you and uh, continuing to uh, represent our community at large. Thank you. Okay, up next we have Jennifer Braisted of the Alzheimer's Association on deck, Flores Laurel Suarez of Compass Outreach and Education Center. Step up is up. Yeah. Step up is on deck. It's coming up. Step up for students. Jacqueline Diaz should be at the podium. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of Broward Delegation. My name is Jacqueline Diaz and I live in Plantation in Center Otsgoods and Representative Campbell's District. I'd like to tell you today how Florida's Education Choice Scholarship have allowed us to find different learning environments that meet our my children's individual needs. I'm a proud mother of five children, two in college and three who are currently benefiting from the Family Empowerment Scholarship. Aiden is in third grade, Saeed is in 11th grade, and both have education savings account on the Unique Abilities Scholarship. Kevin, who is in 10th grade, has the Education Options Scholarship for tuition and fees at Trinidad Academy. Our family has benefited from the scholarship program for many years, and we are so grateful that the legislature has seen the need for educational choices that provide flexibility. It is incredibly valuable to me as a parent to be able to choose the best learning environment for each of my children. With the financial constraints that come with five children, the scholarship half cover tuition and fees to send two of my children at Trinitas Academy. Trinitas provides a small environment that is family driven and they always keep the children's best interests at heart. The Unique Ability Scholarship has allowed us to homeschool our youngest, Aiden. Because of the program is an education savings account, we can constantly look for ways to customize his learning, including using funds for therapy, tutoring, and educational activities. It will be a huge benefit to our family if we could have the same kind of flexibility to use the scholarship funds for tutoring or more educational resources for Kevin on the Educational Options Scholarship in the same way that we do today for Aiden and Saeed on the Unique Abilities Scholarship. I wanna thank you, the legislature, to its continued support of these scholarship programs. And I ask you to please provide and consider giving every scholarship student flexibility in using their scholarship funds for the educational resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Jennifer Bracehead of Alzheimer's Association on deck, Paul Suarez of Compass Outreach and Education Center. Good morning, Madam Chair, distinguished members of the delegation. It's an honor to speak to you all today. My name is Jennifer Bracehead. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Alzheimer's Association here in Florida. Our state resides at the epicenter of this crisis with the second highest prevalence in the country. Just over 580,000 Floridians are living with Alzheimer's disease, including over 42,000 here in Broward County. I know many of you have been touched by the realities of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. 
and you realize all too well that there are currently no good outcomes for people with this disease yet. But with your support, we remain relentlessly optimistic as we propose our 2023 legislative priorities. First, we seek to establish baseline dementia training standards for staff in all long-term care settings. Direct care workers are the single most important determinant of quality dementia care. These providers help shape the daily lives of those living with Alzheimer's by assisting in all aspects of their daily care. We will work in partnership with the long-term care community, knowing that additional training will help facilities with staff retention, morale, and family satisfaction and confidence. Second, we know we must do better in educating our community about the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease and the importance of brain health. A significant amount of people are not discussing their cognitive health with their healthcare providers. That is why we are advocating to require the Department of Health to create the first ever statewide public health awareness campaign that utilizes multiple media platforms and focuses on those from underserved communities who have a higher risk of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And finally, we ask the legislator to continue supporting the funding of programs that have a proven track record in research care and services for those who need services. This includes the Alzheimer's Association Brain Bus, the Alzheimer's Disease Initiative, and the Community Care for the Elderly programs. We thank you so much for your support, and we look forward to seeing you in Tallahassee on February 7th and 8th. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Braysett. Up next, we have Laurel Suarez, Compass Outreach and Education Center. On deck, Sandra Einhorn of the Coordinating Council of Broward. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Broward delegation. My name is Laurel Suarez and my school is in Fort Lauderdale in Senator Jones's and Representative Rock's district. I would like to tell you how Florida's Education Choice Scholarship helped me to create an innovative school that meets students' individual needs. I am a mother of five with over 25 years of experience in education as a teacher and at a charter school management company before I decided to take the leap of faith and design my own school. Once my kids were grown, I decided that I wanted to take the opportunity to create a type of learning environment which would allow teachers to be very innovative and really allow students to fall in love with learning again. I started Compass Outreach Education Center in Fort Lauderdale to offer students the opportunity to explore, discover, and learn in an environment that encourages movement, play, and individuality. Our school now serves students in grades K through six on the Florida Tax Credit and Family Empowerment Scholarship programs. At Compass Outreach and Education Center, we believe in strategic fun and eclectic learning. With a one-room school layout and beautiful outdoor space, our students interact and build relationships while learning from each other. Our school utilizes a customized curriculum that intertwines project-based learning, entrepreneurship, nature education, and a student-centered approach to learning. Our lessons and student volunteer activities create compassionate thinkers who are eager to innovate and change the world. For many of these families, these kinds of experiences would be beyond their financial reach without the assistance of the scholarships. These programs give them options in their education, their child's education that they otherwise would not have. I see firsthand the need for customized learning for students and the flexible spending that education savings accounts provide, such as the Family Empowerment Scholarship for students with unique abilities. I wanna thank the legislature for its continued support of the scholarship program. And I ask this delegation to consider giving more scholarship families the same flexibility in customizing their child's education. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Suarez. Up next, we have Stephanie Pearson. Stephanie Pearson and on deck, Rhonda Roth. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for your service to the county and to the state. Uh, I, my name is Stephanie Pearson and I've been a Broward resident for 39 years and involved in environmental issues all that time. And you should have a copy of my remarks. The production use and disposal of plastics is one of the greatest environmental and health threats of our time. Plastics both large and small are everywhere. 
wreaking havoc on our wildlife, our environment, and as it turns out, our human health. Microplastics have been found in human lungs, breast milk, placentas, and blood, and everywhere on Earth. We are ingesting it and breathing it. As a fossil fuel product, plastics continue uh, to contribute to climate change, and we owe it to our current and future generations to limit plastics, and we can begin with single-use plastics. So what can the state of Florida do? Please work to repeal the onerous 2008 state law that ties the hands of local government to ban or regulate plastics. The legislature can also act on the recommendations of its own retail bag study completed in 2021. In that study, the only group that does not support plastic regulation is the plastic industry itself. Uh, focusing on human health and the economic benefit of regulating plastics is one way to move the issue toward action in a bipartisan way. Uh, there are a few other issues, well, many other issues, but Florida's water bodies need help. This year's leadership in the legislature has made water quality a priority. Let's hold them accountable to improve the regulation of water quality. Let's continue to support Florida Forever, land acquisition program, and the construction of the reservoirs near the Lake Okeechobee. Uh, our state leaders have supported resilience as a response to climate change, but we need to get at the source, greenhouse gas emissions. So we need your support uh, for solar incentives, such as allowing third-party sales and rejecting the moves by our utilities to impose higher bills on solar users we need continued support to grow the electric vehicles movement, uh, which includes incentives and more charging stations for this vital industry. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pearson. Next, we would like to call Rhonda Roth. Ms. Rhonda Roth to the podium. Okay. Um, Matt Cowart of the International Union of Police Association. Next. Oh, Dr. Julia Andrews on deck. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Matt Cower, president of the International Union of Police Associations, also referred to as the IUBA Local 6020. Um, I'm here advocating for a change to the Florida retirement system for our special risk members, our police officers, our firefighters, our correctional officers. Uh, as many of you know, in July of 2011, there were a lot of changes made to the system for the members of those professions, which are very physically demanding, mentally demanding, and emotionally demanding. And the age is tied to being able to be successful in what we want to do, which is provide public safety to the members of the community. And we saw the age get increased from 55 to 60. We saw the years of credible service get increased from 25 to 30. Um, the only thing we're looking to change this legislative session is to get the age back to 55, the years of service back from 30 to 25. It's IUPA's top priority. We partner with the Florida Professional Firefighters. It's their top priority. Uh, Sheriff Tony and the Sheriff's Office supports it. Um, and the Florida Sheriff's Association, it's their top priority. Um, it would boost recruitment and retention. We saw the Florida legislature pass $5,000 recruitment bonuses to bring talented first responders from other states. Um, the bonus will catch their attention, but they're going to see what the retirement is, that they're going to have to come here if you've done nine, 10 years, start over, work till 60, and do more time in a very demanding job. Um, I'm just asking for support. We have sponsors at this point, and the House is going to be Demi Basada Cabrera out of Miami, and in the Senate, it's going to be Senator Ed Hooper. Um, so we're just asking for your support for something that'll be beneficial for public safety, as well as for recruitment and retention, which is tied to the performance of these departments, so we can be successful in keeping the community safe. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Coward. Up next, we have Dr. Julia Andrews of the Florida Academy of Audiology. On deck, Tiffany Grantham of Florida Clean Water. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the delegation. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. As an educational audiologist, I have the blessing to get to work with children who have hearing loss in our community. I get to see firsthand the impact that having access to auditory oral services as well as appropriate hearing devices have on these children. I see them learn language and speech. I have one child this year that moved into our community this past summer with limited language and no voice. 
She spoke some of her first words this past December and is now starting to communicate with her peers and her teachers. I get to see them make progress with reading. Many people don't understand the connection between being able to hear and learning how to read. Um, but with these services and these devices, these children are able to make great progress um, and be similar to their peers that have normal hearing. Having auditory oral services and appropriate hearing devices really opens up so many opportunities for these children and allows them to learn and develop and really grow to their full potential. And so on behalf of the audiologists in our community, as well as the families that we serve, I am simply here to thank you. Thank you for supporting the auditory oral services funding. Thank you for creating the hearing aid fund for our children last year in session. The impact that this support has on our students and our children, really there's no measure for it. Um, words cannot describe the gratitude that we have for the work that you do and the support that you provide the families in our community. And as the president of the Florida Academy of Audiology, I'm really excited to see you all up in Tallahassee for this session and continue working with you on behalf of our profession and the people that we serve. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Dr. Andrews. Up next, we have Tiffany Grantham, Florida Clean Water. On deck, we have Melody Sangberg, McDonald of the Florida Medical Rights Association. Tiffany Grantham, Medical um, Melody Sangberg McDonald. Thank you. On deck, we have Joanne Alvarez of the Federation of Public Employees. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Melody Sandberg McDonald. I um, am the leader at Florida Medical Rights Association. I started this grassroots movement about six years ago uh, for all the wrong reasons we've been growing. Uh, the purpose of our advocacy uh, group is to um, try and restore the rights of people who have been prohibited access to redress in the case of medical negligence. Uh, if you are not married and you have no minor children and you're over the age of 25, if gross ne negligence occurs, um, your family has zero recourse, zero access to a court of law, and we'd like to restore that. Uh, three quick examples. Um, my dad in Broward County passed away here six years ago to a medical overdose um, to drugs that he shouldn't have even had, but was overdosed in a hospital on. Um, we have other cases where a surgeon in Palm Beach County did not complete closing after an operation and the woman died. We have another case where a 25-year-old, um, actually he was 26, one day over 26, um, the PIC line um, was taken out uh, on discharge and air bubble got in and went to his brain and he was brain dead in three minutes. So accidents happen, we all know that, but in order to have a fair access to the law is all that we want. Um, you know, if either of any of these people had been married, they would have re received a trial and, you know, due process. Um, for the last uh, two years, a bill has passed in the House to restore the rights of, of these individuals that are affected by this law. Um, but the Senate has never heard the bill. We do have high expectations that the bills will be submitted again this year in both the House and the Senate. I understand for the Senate that there are, you know, politics that are beyond the scope of uh, what I, I am familiar with, but that uh, corporate interests are very heavily invested in keeping this law in place. I'm sure it saves hospitals and insurance companies a ton of money, but it is very unfair to the people and uh, ask for your support to be heard. I'm open to any questions too. Thank you so much, Ms. Sandberg McDonald. Up next, we'd like to call Joanne Alvarez of the Federation of Public Employees on deck, Dr. Torin Goodrum of FAMU National Alumni Association. Good morning, Madam Chair and the Broward Delegation. My name is Joanne Alvarez and I'm a 35 year going to retire March 28th, thank you. Um, 911 operator here in the and at the Broward County Sheriff's Office and thank you to Sheriff Tony for his incredible support and introduction today as to why I'm here. Um, the profession of 911 telecommunicator has evolved immensely in the 35 years since I've started. What started out as basically, yeah, probably a clerical position has evolved into a certified professional position um, where we are saving lives daily. Um, we used to take maybe a shooting or something once every six months. 
Um, if you watch the news or follow the news, just imagine that on the other end of that event that you're watching, that some person had to listen firsthand to whatever event happened. We know that we've had some very significant events here in Broward County that have effect, affected our operators and do affect them today. But they're professionals and they, they get up and they put their headset back on and they go in there and they dedicate themselves to the profession and the members of Broward County. Um, we are actively looking for a bill, for, uh, as the sergeant, uh, the sheriff mentioned, I demoted him, sorry. Um, we have Representative Jeff Holcomb and Representative David Barrero who are um, presenting on the, the House side and we are actively looking for a Senator to present on the Senate side to have the, the state statute changed where we are recognized as first responders. Um, this will help immensely in retention. We are state certified um, as of 2011, we had to um, take tests and re, uh, have continued ed education so that we are state certified um, professional telecommunicators. We're held to standards. I would ask you that, you know, some of you I've seen and talked to and had many great conversations with about this bill. I've been working on this for six months, uh, six years, and I just ask you for your continued support. And when I come see your smiling faces that, uh, that you will help us out and, and support your, your telecommunications. Do you have a bill number? Uh, we do not. It was just filed. I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, but I will send all of you the, the information as soon as Thank it's available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Up next, we have Dr. Torin Goodrum of FAMU National Alumni Association. On deck, Mr. Jason Morales of SEIU. Good, good afternoon to Madam Chair and the entire delegation. We bring you greetings from Florida a and University, an 1890 land-grant institution located in the state's capital. We, the Broward County Chapter of the FAMU National Alumni Association, congratulate each of you and welcome all newly elected delegates to the Broward delegation. I am Torin Goodrum, Government Relations Chair for our chapter, and today I am assisted by a few members, including our chapter president in the audience. Florida a and University, better known as FAMU, will celebrate 136 years of existence this October. We rank number 103 in the nation among top public universities. Although over 65% of our student population are Pell Grant recipients, we rank number 23 in the nation for social mobility. FAMU is a leader in affordability within the state, and we remain the number one public HBCU in the nation for the fourth consecutive year. These gains could only be made possible with exceptional support from the Florida legislature. Your assistance remains critical as the university moves forward um, towards its goal in becoming a top 100 public university and increase its research classi classification for, um, to be in the highest tier while simultaneously improving academics, standards, and successes and providing access to first time in college and lower students. Continuing on last year's successes, the university's legislative budget request this year includes requests for elevating and sustaining student success, a chemical and biological research lab, upgrades to our ROTC building, and continued support for our heating education center and rescue. Your support for these items would greatly improve our outcomes and ele elevate our national rankings as we mold the minds of tomorrow's leaders. Broward County sends more students to FAMU than any other county outside of Tallahassee. Our alumni chapter participates in numerous community events and provides over $10,000 in student scholarships annually. The state of Florida has afforded the world a treasure that is FAMU, and we appreciate the unwavering support of Broward delegation. We look forward to meeting each of you as we discuss FAMU's legislative budget request and invite you to FAMU Day at the Capitol on April 13th. Thank you. Say it again, Mr. Dr. Dirk. April 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'd like to call Jason Morales of SEIU 1199. On deck, Monica Elliott of the League of Women Voters. Good afternoon, Broward delegation. It's good to see everyone and happy new year. Uh, my name is Jason Morales. I'm here on behalf of SEIU, Service Employees International Union, Local 1199, Healthcare Workers East. Uh, if you don't know, we represent healthcare workers throughout the state, uh, 25,000 active members and retirees, 450,000 nationwide. Um, and so we like to take care of our people that take care of people. Um, as no uh, 
no breaking news, we have a shorting crisis in our nursing home and our hospitals, as you guys know. Um, last year, uh, we, uh, where you guys uh, passed smart legislation to uh, give extra funding to some care uh, facilities that provided $15 an hour to uh, some of our most vulnerable folks. Unfortunately, when that law went passed on October 1st, a lot of the care facilities took that money, but are not using it in the right way. And so we're hoping this session that we can talk to you guys, work with you guys to make sure that this money that they're taking uh, from our tax dollars is being put uh, in the hands, uh, in the pockets of the caregivers uh, that are currently working with our elderly and of course our most vulnerable here in the state. And of course, uh, we have a plethora of uh, healthcare workers who are currently drafting up legislation uh, that will uh, address this issue as well as address the entire Florida care system. Again, we look forward to seeing you up in Tallahassee in the coming months. And um, we look forward to have, continuing this conversation and continue working with you. Um, and thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Morales. Up next, we have Monica Elliott of the League of Women Voters on deck, Shahiwa Jarrett of the Broward County Black Chamber. Hello, good day. My name is Monica Elliott, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Broward County, which is a nonpartisan organization. The primary mission of the League is protection of voting rights. But today, I want to focus on three other League priorities for this session. Reducing plastics is a priority. I have provided the 2021 report regarding single-use carry-out packaging, often referred to as a retail bags report. This report was requested by the legislature and prepared for the Florida DEP. Local governments are ready to reduce plastic waste by enacting rules, regulations, or ordinances, but the legislature has preempted their ability to do so effectively. We ask that this particular preemption law be repealed. The second priority relates to health care and is twofold. Repeal HP5 and allow women to have the basic right of making their own very personal private decisions about their bodies. Second, expand Medicaid in Florida. The third priority relates to funding public education. I have provided the recent research report related to vouchers from the Education Law Center and the Florida Policy Institute. Public tax dollars are being rerouted from public school districts to private school education vouchers, especially through the Family Empowerment Scholarship Program. This program is funded from the Florida Education Financing Program, the FEFP, which means that public tax dollars are being taken from the FEFP and given to private schools, schools that are not accountable to the public. In Broward County, it is estimated that 10.4% of state FEFP funding will be diverted to vouchers for private schools. We are not against vouchers per se, but we need accountability. Please speak with your colleague, Senator Chevron Jones. His district just had a school close without notice this past Tuesday, leaving 106 students on the doorstep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. Up next, we'd like to call Shahiwa Jarrett um, on deck, Ms. Jada Nicole Lowe, Jasmine Carey, and Chastity Rocker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, I think he stepped out. Um, the entire Bar delegation. My name is Shahiwa Jarrett Gellin, and I'm the founder and president of the Broward County Black Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to talk to you about some of our legislative priorities um, coming up this session. We are a one of the newest chambers in the region, but very assertive and very focused on advocacy um, for the resources that our small businesses need in order to continue to be the economic engine that our local uh, communities need. Our chamber has provided services and touched over 4,000 business owners here in Broward County as we provide technical assistance and other one-on-one -on -one training for our uh, members. We don't only provide services for our members, but we also um, have free events that any business owner can um, access. So we provide that service um, to anyone who's in need. This year, we are asking for funding for technical assistance so that we can expand our programming. We have had programming once again in several cities to include uh, Weston, Lauderdale Lakes, Lauder Hill, Sunrise, Plantation, and we're looking to expand our program to the north and to the south, as well as expand the services that we provide beyond um, 
for instance, installing uh, accounting software to help our businesses have um, financial statements, which was um, a need during the pandemic in order to get PPP and other funding, our businesses needed those financial statements and did not have the proper accounting uh, software to do so. And we were able to get a grant to do that. And so we wanna expand that into HR services, marketing, as well as ensuring that our companies have the proper legal structure and that funding um, will allow us to do that. Um, also, we're asking that the there's an amendment made to the Black Business Loan Program that the state has. Um, to make it fully funded on an annual and recurring basis and to expand the program so that there is coverage statewide. I not only started the Broward County Black Chamber of Commerce, but I started the Florida Association of Black Chambers. And so this is one of our um, priorities to make sure all of our chambers can access that funding since access to capital is such a critical need. Thank you. And I look forward to meeting with all of you uh, at our Black Chamber Day uh, in, uh, at the end of March. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jarrett. Up next, we'd like to call Jada Nicole Lowe, Jasmine Carey, and Chastity Rocka, Coalition Against Period Poverty. On deck, Mona Moretsky. Um, if you could hold questions until the presentation has concluded, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Today, we wanted to bring to your attention an issue that is oftentimes overlooked. We are going to be talking about menstrual hygiene and periods. Before we start, I want to note that we purposely use the terms menstrual because cisgender women aren't the only people who have periods. We strive to be inclusive and respectful to all people. My name is Jasmine Carey. I'm a high school junior at Dillard 6 through 12. I serve as advocacy lead in the Coalition Against Period Poverty. Lauderdale Lakes, I live in Lauderdale Lakes, making me a constituent of Senator Osgood and Representative Dunkley. I would also like to thank all of the representatives and senators that co-sponsored Learning with Dignity Bill. The bill would require Florida public schools <laughs> We will require Florida public schools providing cost-free products, having pads and tampons that are easily accessible in our school restrooms will ensure that students who get periods will have trouble-free access to these products and will be able to continue their academics feeling clean and confident. As a member of our community and administrator, I hold this topic in high regards. They are not a choice, yet they are crucial in society and well-being. This is why Learning with Dignity has been created. It would be negligent for us to ignore the fact that people's financial situation determines if they can or cannot obtain access to menstrual products. This is why it is important to have these dispensers free of cost within school restrooms. All menstruators deserve access to necessary hygiene products. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Chastity Roker, a junior at Dillard High 6 through 12. I'm a resident of Fort Lauderdale and a member of the Coalition Against Period Poverty, as well as an active member of God's Gift Inc. I am a proud constituent of Senator Dr. Rosalind Osgood and Representative Daryl Campbell. I would like to speak to you today about the immense taboos surrounding period poverty. This issue is often a subject that many people experience and struggle with, but very few talk about it. According to the research article, State of the Period Things, 23% of students struggle to afford period products. It is my desire that these statistics provide you with an understanding of how much this truly affects today's youth. It is utterly important that we as a community invest in our researches such as public education, health education, and social campaigns to bring awareness to this issue. Educate your kids, families, and friends to, to not associate periods with shame or indignity. Thank you legislators for your time and commitment to the community and a special thing, that special thanks for your attention today. We are the leaders of tomorrow. We, we look forward to working with you in the near future. Hello everyone, I'm Jada Nicole, a junior at Dillard 6 through 12 and a resident of Lauderdale Lakes. I am an advocacy lead in the Coalition Against Period Poverty as well as an active member of God's Gift. I am a proud constituent of Senator Osgood and Representative Campbell. To combat period poverty, there has been work done on a global, national and local scale. Scotland was the first country in the world to make period products completely free to anyone in need. New Zealand has made period products free in public schools nationwide in 2021. California, Hawaii, Delaware, and Maine mandate schools to have free period products in the classroom in grades six through 12. We are striving to implement this requirement in our Florida schools. Through God's gift, I have been part of efforts to collect and assemble period products. We have provided for those in need in Broward County. We are excited to see a few familiar faces. Representative Campbell has joined us for our period packaging event in August, and Senator Osgood and Representative Ponshevsky were able to join us for our event in 2021. 
Your attendance today show that you care about the futures of our students in Florida. You can help by co-sponsoring the Learning with Dignity Bill, voting yes if it comes to your committee, while encouraging others to do the same and supporting local pilot programs and menstrual equity organizations for immediate impact. Please prove that you care about this pressing issue and show us your support today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Hold on, hold. Can you can you come back, please? Hello. Do you have a bill a bill number? Uh, we are not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, Representative Dunkley and Representative Campbell, if you're not taking up this issue, I will, and I want to say thank you. You're bold. You're beautiful. And you're taking on a conversation that we have all been shamed for. So I want to say thank you very much for doing what you have done. And because your name is associated with someone I have known before she was born, I would make sure that I follow this. Thank you very much. He, he, want, he has a comment, not a question, a comment. I, I have a quick comment. I just want to say how proud I am of the young ladies of the work you guys have been putting in. Uh, the first time that I met Ms. Uh, Jenna Nicole, she asked me about 300 questions. She she really she really hit me with questions, and I, I she had me sweat bullets for a second. So I'm looking forward to returning the favor while you were up there. So I'm not I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I I am interested in your bill and looking forward to talking with you a little bit further and seeing how we can get that across. All right. Okay. Up next, we have Mona Moretsky on deck. Lucy Brawls, mom. I'm sorry. Yes, um, the young lady that just presented, Representative Dunkley here, I am so proud of you guys, and as your representative, I feel proud to, to see you guys and how you delivered yourself today, and I do look forward to working with you on making sure your bill gets passed. Up next, we have Mona Moretsky on deck, Lucy Rolls of Mon Demand Action. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I am Mona Moretsky, and I'm representing myself and the tens of thousands of loved ones of the over 80,000 incarcerated in the state of Florida. I'm here seeking the creation of a volunteer citizens collaborative board. The board would consist of a group of volunteers either appointed by the legislature or assembled through Volunteer Florida that would help transcend the turmoil that currently exists between the incarcerated, the loved ones, and the Florida Department of Corrections. The board would be able to go into prisons unannounced, similar to the unannounced visits you as the legislature are tasked with doing. Um, people would ask how come this wouldn't be handled through the Inspector General's department? Well, what we're thinking of doing is that um, this would include anything that the incarcerated people want to talk about and often will not talk about because they're afraid of the retributions that they have seen. Um, then someone says, why don't they just handle it within the jail system? That is true as well. For doing something as small as reporting a, a not working water fountain or cold water in the showers, we have seen how people have been punished for reporting those things. And so we decided at this point of time that if we had a volunteer community citizens board that was brought together, that's a mix of people that could listen to the problems and help make suggestions that this might work. It's really truly time to stop sweeping these issues under the table. It's time to create this volunteer citizens collaborative board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'd like to call Lucy Rouse of Moms Demand Action on deck, Marty Norris of Family Care Council, Area 10. Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Rolls, and I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We are the largest grassroots movement fighting for public safety measures to protect people from gun violence. Guns are now the leading cause of death for American children. We have more guns in this country than people. There is now supportive evidence that child access prevention laws reduce firearm homicides and self-injuries among children, and that permitless carry laws increase the levels of firearm violence, according to a new RAND Corporation report. As the legislative session gets underway, 
We ask for your support for policies that save lives and help keep our communities safer from gun violence. I stand here firmly with the majority of Floridians who oppose permitless carry, also misleadingly known as constitutional carry or shall issue con concealed carry. Any attempt to enact this dangerous legislation is a step towards dismantling our state's culture of responsible gun ownership and respect for the Second Amendment. Permitless carry legislation would allow people to carry firearms openly or concealed in public places without a permit, criminal history check, or safety training. Florida's current licensing system ensures that people carrying handguns in public have passed a criminal background check and have undergone firearm safety training, both of which are critical components of responsible gun ownership. Permitless carry laws are also a threat to our dedicated law enforcement professionals and firefighters, the first responders who put their lives on the line every day to protect us. Multiple studies have found that the presence of a gun makes people more aggressive, and the research indicates that permitless carry can, and more than likely will, increase gun violence. States that have weakened their firearm permitting system have experienced a 13 to 15% increase in handgun homicide and violent crime rates. Bottom line, more people will needlessly die if the dangerous policy of permitless carry is passed in Florida. Thank gun you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rep, Rep. Golly would likely see you. I mean, Daly, I'm sorry. Have a question or would like to speak to you. Which one? Thank you, Comment. Comment, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Lucy, thank you, uh, first and foremost, and thank you to Mom's Demand. I, I mean, I understand in this state, you understand in this state what an uphill battle it is, particularly with the, the power and the strength of the NRA with this legislature yes. uh, and groups like that. And so, I don't want you to ever take what you and the other moms do uh, for granted. It really does make a difference and it really does move the needle, even in Tallahassee. So I always love to see you all. I always love to see you up in Tallahassee. Please continue to come and please continue to be in this fight with us. Um, as it relates to permitless carry, um, I think I probably speak for everyone here when, when I say we oppose it uh, and we'll do what we can to fight it in Tallahassee. I think one of the things, and, and you may have touched on it, I had to come in a couple seconds late, uh, but one of the things that people don't realize, and this is why I'm glad to hear the sheriff speak on it earlier, is in almost every state that it's passed, the law enforcement community has opposed it, and states that have gone ahead and passed it anyway have seen increased rates of officer-related shootings. And so if we are the free state of Florida and we support our first responders and we support our law enforcement, then we should listen to them, certainly on an issue like this, because um, permitless carry, or as they like to say, constitutional carry is unfathomable to me, and I know so many others. So thank you for what you continue to do. Thank you. Hey, up next, we'd like to call Marty Norris of Family Care Council Area 10. Hi, everyone. My name is Marty Norris, and I'm here on behalf of the Broward County Developmental Disabilities Community. And um, their respective families. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. Your time and your dedication towards our community is very impactful. Um, a little bit about the Family Care Council, and I'll try to do the elevator speech. In 1993, we were written into Florida statute to serve as a council, as volunteers, and we're all immediate family members and or had a developmental disability. Where our mission statement is to educate and support those individuals and their families and work in collaborative efforts with the agencies for persons with disabilities. As different programs have come through, agency for persons with disabilities, sometimes where the test pilot cases, but at the same time, we provide these feedback that we receive from our community. So again, I'm gonna be brief because there's one more to speak to you and I wanna thank you once again. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Um, for Moms Demand Actions, Rep. Christina, you had? Okay, she had a comment and I passed her over so I wanna apologize beforehand, but let you know she would like to speak to you. 
So up next, we'd like to call Steve Moyer of Children and Student Safety on deck, Maria Masari of Parents of Adults with Disabilities. Hey, good afternoon. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to especially thank uh, the past sponsors of uh, and co-sponsors of the restraint seclusion legislation that passed in 20 and, uh, 21 and 22, specifically Senator Book, Representative Hoshoski and Representative Woodson for being your co-sponsors. Thank you very much. Uh, and to all members that voted unanimously to pass these bills, uh, because of uh, you guys, disabled students will not be put into padded cells or straitjackets any longer in the state of Florida. Thank you. It was common practice. On behalf of the Autism Society of Florida, I want to advise you that 99 children drowned in Florida last year. Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez of Miami is sponsoring Senate Bill 74 and 84. That might help address some of this. There are no co-sponsors or house sponsors at this time. And uh, a subject that's a special interest to me personally, Representative Escamani of Orange County has a bill in drafting that will address students that may wander or elope from their schools. Um, students mostly disabled with little or no awareness of danger. Uh, some have died after wandering away from their schools. Uh, the, the bill would, which is modeled after Senator Book's bills from previous sessions, would mandate a simple no cost plan to be made for every public school that would go into action immediately when a student is noted as being missing. Uh, precious seconds would be saved by leaping into action, sending specific staff members to walk the perimeter, go to hazards like roads, water hazards, uh, to notify the police and the parents, and perhaps save a life without spending a dime. So if you all consider that, I appreciate it very much. And uh, TGIF, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moyer. Up next, we'd like to call Maria Masari of Parents of Adults with Disabilities. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, representatives and senators. I'm very nervous. This is my first time. I wanna thank you all for the time and the dedication that you give us all. I came here today to represent parents um, who have children with disabilities um, and especially parents like myself who are single moms and uh, have many have very little options and choices. We my issue is with CDC Plus, um, that is the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. And um, there are issues with them and how they run their agency and how they treat the parents and the kids with dis with disabilities. The rules that were promulgated when um, they were put into place back in 1974, and as with anything, they're antiquated. From that from those times things have changed and they no longer make any sense. Today, the St. Jesse is supposed to help children, and adults with disabilities, and in turn make our lives of the parent um, a bit easier. Our lives are extremely stressful. In fact, we don't even have a life, but instead CDC plus stresses us and brings us more problems, sadness, and in our lives. In fact, the agency, it was ran so poorly by Barbara Palmer, who is the director, that um, Governor Ron DeSantis has accepted her resignation. There has been many lawsuits filed against the agency for abuse, um, autistic children being tied down to beds and group homes, and they have directly mentioned her. Um, so the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to hear about that. It's my first time. Um, the Agency of People with Disabilities has um, me, um, mentioned uh, directly, okay, <laughs> with the abuse and neglect of these uh, very vulnerable population. Um, I find that um, I find that unless having a child or an adult or knows one, most of our representatives, unfortunately, and, and senators don't have an appetite or take an interest in helping the disabled and the parents of these amazing human beings. They're not second class citizens. They they should not be treated as such. They deserve to be treated with the same respect, dignity, and be protected as everyone else, and as much as you guys protect your typical children. No one knows how hard our lives are unless you walk in my shoes. If anyone here today would like to help us and want more information, please come and speak with me. Um, I also would like to address one quick issue, um, speak about a bill that um, I spoke with a lobbyist by the name of Lori Killinger, who was going to be supposedly put on the floor. It is regarding um, lawsuits that my daughter has ha had to sue her father for adult support. But unfortunately, when these laws were put back in the 70s. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Attorney. 
if the time is up, it's at your discretion. Okay. Um, if, do you have a bill number that you're speaking of? No, because, because if, no, if because it's something, if there's a lawsuit has been filed and an attorney is included in that, no. we would not like to no, there is make no a comment or. No, Madam okay. Chair, there is no attorney in this lawsuit. It's my daughter with her dad and a case law has been created. But the point is that there was no guidance given to us for adult support as to where child okay. support. Mr. Attorney. That's all. We cannot offer any legal advice here. And I would not recommend that if, uh, if this is a matter that uh, is currently under litigation or, or potential litigation that uh, you consider that before continuing. Okay, I'm not asking for advice or any legal. I'm asking for a bill to be put on the floor so that they can tweak and change the, the antiquated laws and give us more guidance on how to calculate it also, but no legal, I have an attorney. Do you, do you have a bill number? You know the bill? No, because I can't find anyone to put it on the floor. Okay, I will speak to you immediately you. after this. I have a conversation to see if I can locate something for us. Thank you very, very much all. Happy New Year. Quite welcome. Thank you. That is the end of our agenda. You all did a fabulous job, everyone who's here. Just by way of announcements, Broward Days in Tallahassee is March 21 and 22. And for our members and staff, we um, are getting invites from the county, the League of Cities, and the Broward School Board for a workshop. So watch your emails for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our staff members that's here, that stuck around, and you have the experience of working along with us. And to my staff assistant here, Mr. Um, Connor O'Brien, he did a great job. I want to say thank you. To my representatives and senators that have been with, him with me, we have refreshments in the back, and I want to say thank you for taking on the responsibility and sticking with me today. Meeting with Dern.